I will now call the regular school board meeting to order at 5 p.m. Mrs. Sinclair, please call the roll. District 1, Barbara McQuinn. Here. District 2, Alexandria Ayala. Here. District 3, Karen Brill. Here. District 4, Erica Whitfield. Here. District 5, Frank Barbieri. Here. District 6, Marsha Andrews. Here. District 7, Edwin Ferguson. Here. Also joining us is Superintendent Michael Burke, General Counsel Sean Bernard, Inspector General Teresa Michael, Board Clerk Tony Sinclair, and Student County President Faisal Abadawi. Senior mem staff members will join us periodically as directed by the superintendent. Tonight, the national anthem will be performed by the Conserva Conservatory School Chamber Ensemble under the direction of Asa Levy Nadal, a teacher at the school. Would everyone please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by the national anthem. Let, uh, the Pledge of Allegiance will now be led by Mrs. Whitfield. Viewers and listeners can access the meeting today by either watching on Comcast channels 234 and 235, UVerse channel 99, or by using the YouTube link on our webpage at palmbeachschools.org. In the event that the link is interrupted for technical reasons, please switch over to the TV channels. All board meetings are recorded in their entirety and posted on the district website within 24 hours. We also offer a listening only option, which the public can access by calling 561-357-5900 or toll free at 1-866-930-7018. The meeting ID is 1-561-880-1124 pound. Board members, we have four sets of minutes on the agenda today. I'll take a motion to approve the minutes. Motion by Mrs. Ayala, seconded by Mrs. Whitfield. Any discussion? All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Let me just get here. Okay, I have uh, one item to add for good cause, PT, P2 personnel addendum, good cause exists for adding this item so that employees can begin in their new positions as soon as possible. Mr. Superintendent, do you have any items to withdraw? Yes, I'll be withdrawing COM5 and we're gonna reschedule that to when the student's able to join us here. Thank you. Board members, do you have any items to pull from the consent agenda? Okay, so we'll now move to approve the, uh, to approve the agenda. Mr. Ferguson, oh, motion by Mr. Barbieri, second by Mrs. Whitfield. We're on, are we on item six now? So Madam Chair, since we have a number of members from Dr. Anderson's family, Dr. Arthur Anderson, former school board in attendance, I would like to make a motion to reorder the agenda and take item BRD1, the posthumous proclamation for Dr. Arthur Anderson out of order and to read it and vote on it after board member comments. So we have a substitute motion on the floor. Do I have a uh, second? Second by Mrs. Andrews. All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. 
That will bring us to disclosures and abstentions. Any disclosures or abstentions? Seeing none, that will move us over to board member and superintendent comments. Mr. Superintendent. Yes, thank you and good evening. Uh, April is School Library Month, so I wanted to just uh, share a couple events related to that. Uh, last week on Thursday, April 11th, the Educational Media Association, uh, known as EMMA, uh, that's uh, chaired by Carolyn Epstein from Binks Forest Elementary School, and uh, I'm sorry, Caroline Epstein from Binks, and then Carolyn Brandt from Palm Beach Gardens High School, hosted a, a nice annual celebration of our media specialists. I know many of the board members were there with me, and uh, that was just terrific to be a part of. And then also we had our annual Battle of the Books where we had students read 15 different books and then go through a trivia competition. So I'd like to congratulate the following schools that were the winner. So the elementary school winner is Citrus Cove Elementary School. The middle school winner is West Boynton Beach Middle School, which is a brand new school, so they're starting strong. And then our high school winner was Suncoast High School. So we continue to celebrate Library Media Month. Um, also, big news, the annual uh, Dwyer Award finalists have been announced. This is the annual event the Economic Council hosts for us, and it'll be the 40th annual this year, which is named in, you know, for the namesake is William T. Dwyer, uh, and also we have a high school, of course, named after Mr. Dwyer. And this promotes excellence in education, and we have also this year, this happened last year, but again for the 40th annual, all 28 finalists are from our district-operated public schools. And then what's really pretty incredible, Miss Ayala will be happy about this, Palm Springs Middle School has three of the finalists. I don't know if that's ever happened. So Palm Springs Middle School is doing some excellent work there. And this will be a big event uh, at, on May 14th at the Kravitz Center. So congratulations to all our finalists. And then I wanted to thank both our team in HR led by Mr. Kubrick and our communications team led by Mr. Cooley for really partnering to have one of the best job fairs I think we've ever had. We had over a thousand candidates at the South Florida Fair grounds uh, a couple weeks ago and we were able to extend a lot of job offers. The turnout was great. The, the marketing for the event really paid off. And if you happen to miss the job fair, no worries. We continue to hire and please, uh, you can go to our recruitment page at palmbeachschools.org for anybody that might be interested out there that'd like to be part of Team Palm Beach. And I've got a little video here just to kind of show you how that went down. We are super excited to have over a thousand candidates coming to the fair today. We had lines outside lined up and it just shows that everybody knows that Palm Beach County School District is absolutely your best choice. We have teaching jobs, we have a paraprofessional job, custodians, food service, police, you name it, we, we have it. So it's exciting to get kickoff hiring for next school year today. We have over 160 schools here represented. Hi, I'm Mrs. De La Vega, the principal Hi. of Panther Run. Welcome to the job fair. We're a dual language school. So we have some great opportunities here. Our schools and our principals and our hiring managers are talking to great quality candidates, offering them jobs on the spot. I rang the bell because I just hired another teacher to join my Forest Park Elementary family. I'm excited to be a second grade teacher. <laughs> the talent here is really what makes this district absolutely the very best choice and the best place to work. Palm Beach County Schools offers uh, a career where you can really make a difference in kids' lives. And, and going to, to a job that where you feel that every day and you see what you're doing for kids uh, makes it just a little bit more special. So if you didn't get to come here today and if you didn't get to meet our great administrators and find out about our opportunities, you can go on our website, palmbeachschools.org. We hire all year around as the largest employer in the county. We have plenty of opportunity for great quality candidates to come join our team. All right. Yeah, I also want to thank all our principals that got stepped away from their busy jobs to be there to uh, handle their piece of the recruitment uh, task. April's also, we've now in our second year of doing our kindergarten roundup in which we are providing kindergarten readiness kits to all of our parents and their families so that kids can come to the first school, first day of school in August ready to go, and that, that's going very well. And then I just wanted to take a moment to recognize our former governor and senator, Mr. Bob Graham. He was an ardent supporter of education and uh, just really want to kind of take a moment just to recognize everything he's done for, had done for us over the years. And uh, Madam Chair, that concludes my comments. Thank you. Ms. Ayala. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Good evening, everyone. Um, I had some photos and a video I wanted to share with everybody tonight on a recap of what's been going on around District 2. So I was invited uh, last week to attend career day at Diamond View Elementary School, which was awesome. The students um, under the direction of Principal Seal and Dr. Cindy White, who is one of our most outstanding educators, and I'm always so happy to be with her, focused on firsts and what it means to be a first and break those barriers. So I was privileged to be invited to talk about being the first Latina on the school board and the youngest person elected with the students, as well as learning about other firsts throughout our history. We had a, um, a Taylor Swift there and her a lot going on at the moment shirt, so she'd like to be the other first Taylor Swift. Um, we talked about, you know, how to be the next history maker, that the world is really full of endless possibilities, especially with the Palm Beach County Schools education. So I want to thank them for inviting me to participate in this beautiful day. Um, it was always great to speak with the students about their hopes and dreams. Next, we had a really awesome dedication ceremony last week at Malaluka Elementary School, one of the new buildings that we have in the school district of Palm Beach County, thanks to the generous support of our taxpayers for our penny sales tax. And it was an incredible program led by Dr. Maupin and really led by her students who guided us through how excited they are for their new um, home at the Eagles there. So I'm gonna ask that we play the video so you can see a little bit more about our morning. Today, we've gathered to dedicate this beautiful new building. Flabbergasted. This school is like a much, a really welcoming space. Malaluka is such a special school because of its community. It's the diversity that makes us strong. It's the students who are able to be bilingual or trilingual. It's the band program. There are so many things that make this place special. Having a beautiful new school here um, for the benefit of the kids is just very enlightening, very heartwarming to, uh, for us to demonstrate how much we care about them, and how much we want to invest in their future. The other thing that really strikes me is once you're a Melaleuca Eagle, you're always an Eagle. Our kids really took ownership of the dedication process. New building will allow future generations to make great elementary school memories. Every grade level did something in today's dedication, and that meant a lot to me as the principal because the kids really wanted to say, this is who we are, this is our school, and we're excited to be here. It's going to allow all the, the, all the other Eagles to shine and soar, and it's, it's really like big, so I hope they have fun in the school. A lot of the students you saw there were fifth graders, so unfortunately they will not be in the school long, but they're going off to some wonderful middle schools in our district, and they were so happy for their new building. Um, that is one of our gems in District 2, so if you don't know about Melaleuca Elementary, now you know. Uh, next, I'd like to point out a couple of things in the agenda that we'll be reviewing and voting on tonight that I just want to take a moment to give some positive commentary about. One of them um, is COM3, where we'll be um, recognizing an adult education department awarded incentive grant, and that is going to be assisting um, groups that are ESOL students um, really hone in on their English skills, and I, I want to thank everybody involved with that um, for at the Ad Adult Education Center, Fred Barch, um, the principal of the Adult Education uh, Center, for ensuring that we're providing resources for our students and our adult learners to become proficient in their English and be able to be involved in our society in a meaningful way. And the next one is our EGS1, which is um, really special. Uh, or I'm sorry, REGC1, because that is, I want to give a moment to recognize um, a alumnus of John I. Leonard High School, my alma mater, Mr. Barry Colbertson, who is donating $10,000, and I know my time is up, to the John I. Leonard High School um, Friends of Education Scholarship Fund. So I want to give him a recognition and a thank you for supporting future Lancers in their continued education. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Whitfield. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to take a little bit of time um, during my comments to talk about the point in time count that was recently done um, in Palm Beach County. The point in time count is an opportunity as a community that we have to uh, count how many homeless people we have in Palm Beach County and really see the trends over time to see how we're doing as a community as far as housing our, our community members. Um, point in time count is um, something that I've participated in many, many years in a row. Um, I go out there and I participate as a 
volunteer and help to, to count people. Um, I usually go to St. Anne's um, in uh, West Palm Beach, and um, it's, you know, it's always a, a humbling moment for me. Um, the uh, counts just came out from this year, and we don't have the opportunity to count every person who's homeless within Palm Beach County. It's just whoever we can get to within 24 hours. Um, and there's something that's run by the county. But I just want to let you all know the numbers, where we're at, because um, I think it's very important for us as a community. Um, so our numbers this year for the homeless people um, that were found in Palm Beach County were 2,126 uh, people. 546 of those were sheltered. 411 were in emergency shelter situation. And 135 were in transitional housing. What I think is a very important number for us to understand is that this number has gone up 14.6% since last year. That's an additional 271 people that were counted. Um, families actually went down 20 number of families. Um, single people went up 291, but the most important number of all is unsheltered youth were um, 32 last year and they went up to 72 this year. So I think that um, for the school district of Palm Beach County is um, very, very important. And when we talk about trying to educate students that don't have a home to go to every night, um, don't have a safe place to be, and potentially don't have food access to it, um, it is almost impossible to make education their priority. So um, those are some numbers I wanted to share, especially as the um, Homeless Advisory Board representative uh, for the school board. Uh, finally, with my last couple seconds, I just want to say um, that uh, we have uh, some good news. Um, the Education Foundation, I know we're going to hear from Mr. Gavrilos tonight, um, their building is coming along so nicely in Lake Worth Beach. And I just want to encourage all of my fellow board members to do a drive-by whenever they have a chance. It's 1515 Barton Road in Lake Worth Beach, the site of the old South Intensive. Um, the brand new building is going up. The walls are up. And soon we will be adding a roof to the structure. It's very exciting to see. I think this is going to be a huge uh, benefit to the city of Lake Worth Beach and the entire entire community of Palm Beach County. Um, the Red Apple Supply Store is going to be huge. Um, it's going to supply educational supplies for our, all of our hardworking teachers. So hopefully they don't have to pull out of their pockets, which we know they have been doing, to um, help our students. So I think this will expand it, and it's just going to be a huge benefit to Palm Beach County. So I encourage everyone to go by and see this new building in action. We're very, very proud of it, and I'm proud it's in my own backyard. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Barbieri. Yeah, I, I would just like to take a minute to recognize West Boca Raton Community High School this morning. Uh, like they do every year, they hosted the Leadership uh, Boca group, the group of business people that uh, tour our schools. They tour the public schools, the private schools, and the, and the colleges here in Palm Beach County. They always start at West Boca High School where the Culinary Institute puts uh, the Culinary Academy, feeds all of these people, uh, did a great job. Our student county government president, uh, Al Badawi, was there and told the group about him being the fourth year in the medical academy there and what his plans are. And um, I was very proud of the, the, the way it was handled this morning. I congratulate uh, Pr Principal Capitano and the staff there for doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Andrews. Thank you, and I'll probably have some pictures that will show. But I want to say that it was so wonderful to be with the media specialists this week to celebrate them for the great work that they do in our media centers. It's been a tough uh, ride for them over the last year or so, but they have been able to keep our media centers strong and healthy with great books, great support for all of our children. Congratulations to all of our media specialists within the school district of Palm Beach County, as well as our media clerks. And Teamwork USA Foundation had the 12th Annual Scholarship Award Ceremony. Uh, they make dreams come true for our children. On Saturday, we were at Marisol Country Club in Palm Beach Gardens, where Teamwork USA gave 42 scholarships. And this was the 12th year. I want to thank the Teamwork USA Foundation for all you do every day for our children, and you do make dreams come true. And I had an opportunity to be with the uh, T. Leroy Jefferson Healthcare and Science uh, Stars of Tomorrow Career Symposium at Inlet Grove this past Saturday. 
and they are looking at all of our children, the stars of tomorrow in health care. It was exciting to see the students there dressed in their attire, ready to become nurses, doctors in the medical field, looking at the STEM programs for young people as they move forward, and looking to make sure that their job's ready for them because the training is happening right here in the Palm Beach County School District. And I also had an opportunity to work with the Palm Beach County Commission and the Palm Beach County system with Palm Tran. It was an opportunity for me to be a champion for riding the bus. I had not been on the bus for a while as a rider myself, so I was able to get my pass, put some money in the uh, coin toss, and ride the bus to be a champion. We must use our bus system and we must mingle. And it was a wonderful opportunity for me to bring a group of my friends to ride the bus from Palm Beach State College and Belle Glade all the way to West Tech, talk about the programs at our West Technical Education Center and how we must encourage all to ride the bus. You don't have to drive anymore. We have great buses with the county and they're waiting to take us everywhere we want to go. It was a lovely experience to be a champion. And also on the agenda tonight, we have two big items that I think I'd like to uh, highlight and say thank you. I'd like to say thank you to the uh, Board of County Commissioners for the summer program summer camps. It's so important for children to have a wonderful opportunity in the summer to be able to do the things necessary to keep growth and academic structure and social and emotional health in order. So this summer, we're going to be having a summer program at Rosenwald Elementary School, Pahokee Middle Senior High School, uh, Canal Point, Pioneer Park, We'll all have enrichment activities. It's going to be $111,000 coming from the county, from the youth department, to make sure our children have the best. And lastly on the agenda, it's all about our children. The NFL, you're awesome. College Football Playoff Foundation, you're making it happen with $60,000 to makeover media centers, media centers right here in Palm Beach County. K.E. Cunningham Elementary School, Jerry Thomas, Banyan Creek, Carver, Loxahatchee Groves, Indian Pines, hooray. We're getting the monies in the place where it's needed to help our children. Hooray for Media Center Month, as well as our media specialists, but for this award from College Football Playoff Foundation on our agenda tonight, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ferguson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a few uh, brief announcements. Firstly, we were able to do our Town Hall 11 at South Grade Elementary today. Um, I have a quick photo that communications will put up. Um, we had about 40 uh, parents and, and children at this event. It was about the early education um, opportunities that are available for our children before they get into kindergarten. So again, I want to thank Dr. Anna R.C. Gonzalez for opening up her school, especially during a testing week, um, so that we could have this uh, very worthwhile event. Also, uh, the monthly Project Uplift Community Cleanup event is scheduled for Saturday, April 27th. We'll be at Bloom Park in West Palm Beach. Bloom Park is located at 518 23rd Street. Um, we're already getting a lot of uh, requests in terms of students, particularly seniors who are interested in getting some additional community service hours. So if you are a senior, high school age student, middle school student, it really doesn't matter, or more importantly, just a citizen here in Palm Beach County, come on out and, and, and join us. It's always a fun time. You can get more information by contacting my office, which is at 561-840-1846. Also, we did have a really large turnout last month, but if you're a student under the age of 18, we will need your parent to show up at the site to sign the necessary waiver form so that we can allow you to participate. We don't want to turn anyone away. Um, also, we had a, river, a groundbreaking at Riviera Beach High School. Um, last week, we have a photo and a video that we're going to show. That was a great, great event and communication. You all can go ahead and queue up the video, please. Hi, I'm Dr. Alicia McKnight, proud principal of West Riviera Elementary School. Today we're here for our exciting new groundbreaking of our new school. At our groundbreaking today, we are excited to have our district superintendent, Mike Burke. We are really proud to be able to start building a new facility, a new campus uh, for the bus days. And this is gonna get a complete overhaul. We're gonna have a six to 7,000 square foot brand new building. Our school community is very excited about this new building. I can't wait to see the faces of the babies through this school when we open up the doors. There's nothing like it. The anticipation has been building about our new state of the art 
building with great technology, all the new bells and whistles for our students to help increase their learning opportunities for growth. It was so exciting today to have the groundbreaking ceremony where myself, several students, staff members, um, board members were able to turn the dirt Three. in anticipation of the construction of our new building. I'm ready to start building our new school. That was great. Um, lastly, I wanted uh, two more things. I want to give a shout out to our students. I know we're in the beginning of the testing phase. Again, I just want to reiterate students, uh, teachers, staff, parents, we believe in you. We know you all are going to knock it out of the park. So shoot for the higher mark. We're expecting some really uh, great things from you. And last but not least, with my last minute, I just want to say three things. Let's go heat. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> thank you, Vice Chair McQuinn. Yes, thank you. I'd like to start with the kudos to the conservatory school in North Palm Beach, to the chamber. I hope that ensemble is said with three syllables. I'm not 100% sure. I'm getting some nods. Can you believe, if you don't know this, these students are not even in high school yet. We're talking middle school students who perform at that level. So great job for their principal, Mr. Schumann, and their teachers, and, um, and actually the community who's very, so very supportive of them, very proud of them. On that same tone, note then, congratulations to, for the eighth year in a row, our school district has earned the prestigious Best Communities for Music Education designation from the National Association of Music Merchants Foundation. Mr. Cleve Maloon is our district's K-12 arts program, so not just music, our arts program, program planner. And Mr. Maloon was an instructor. Actually, I got to hire him to Palm Beach County. I thought I would throw that in there. But he, uh, he was an instructor also at the conservatory school, and then he came to the, to the district office to work with all of the arts. And he says it best. He said, I am proud of our music teachers, administrators, leadership, and community partners for achieving this outstanding recognition because it does require the community also. And I do want to share with you, because this is important, just educating you, that in 2018, we had a tax referendum that allowed us to fund more than 750 school fine arts, choice, and career academy positions. This was renewed in 2022, continued, which allows us this funding of our school fine arts programs in the district. And we're so very proud of all of our fine arts. And finally, I had the privilege a few weeks ago of recognizing through the Our Education Foundation, Senator Bobby Powell, Jr. He was awarded the Distinguished Alumni Award, and these are our very distinguished celebrity status, Palm Beach County public school graduates who have gone on in wonderful leadership roles. And so it was very exciting. And of course, you know I'm going to throw in there that he was also one of my students. So it's a really good night for, and I will tell you, even, you know, educators, we don't make a ton of money. But when you get to see the kids that you've had the privilege of working with, seriously, it's just a lifetime of wonderfulness. Thank you. Thank you. And so tonight I want to talk about a very special presentation that I had the privilege to attend yesterday called Names, Names Not Numbers, a movie in the making at Loggers Run Middle School. Names Not Numbers is a trademark way to teach the lessons of the Holocaust, and it was created by Mrs. Tova Fish Rosenberg, and it epitomized what project-based learning is. And I want to talk to you for a few moments about what I actually saw. So a group of students in the Holocaust education class of um, Julie Gates had the opportunity to learn how to interview and film and put together this documentary. It started off with our own Rick Blackwell 
teaching the students how to create interview questions, how to interview a person, how to ask questions, and to wait for the response. They also had a videographer and instructor, Carlos Sanchez, teaching them how to work the camera so that they did all the camera work, teaching how to zoom in, how to zoom out. So these students got together. They interviewed three Holocaust survivors. They wrote the questions. They interviewed the survivors. They filmed the survivors. They edited the film. This was, a, an, a, in my estimation, an award-winning film. After they put together the project, you saw the students on camera talking about what they got out of the project in meeting these survivors. Because as you know, this generation is the last that's going to have the opportunity to speak to people who live through that history. And I just have to tell you that the end of it was so poignant because they spoke about what they learned and then they asked each of the survivors what they wanted the next generation to know about the Holocaust and their experience and what they hope for the future. And so I just want to thank Principal Dr. Krista Rogers for this program and also our Holocaust Studies program planner, Kimberly Combs, who put this together. Um, I will be sending the link to this 50-minute documentary through the board office to all of you. Hope you take the moment to take a look at it because to see what these students put together from soup to nuts, from the beginning, from the concept, all the way through to the final presentation, it was really quite memorable. Also, I had the opportunity, in addition to attending many of the events that you heard about, I was able to attend the Thank a Teacher event at L.C. Swain Middle School, where we honored our Teacher of the Month, Ann Spear. And we have a video to show you of that, if somebody could please put the video up. Hi, I'm Ann Spear, and I'm a language arts teacher here at L.C. Swain Middle School. It's a beautiful day in South Florida. How do you leave the world a better place? How do you make a difference? Okay. And I have the opportunity to do that every day. Can you guys remember Danny? With each student, even if it's just a little something. As educators, we are entrusted with a privilege, and that is working with these kids. And each of these kids is awesome. They do show kindness to me every day. They, there is something great and unique about each of these kids, and I'm entrusted with that. And so I take my responsibility very seriously while they're in my care. Ms. Spear, congratulations. You are receiving $250 from Thank a Teacher. I'm grateful to have such an exceptional coworker, and Elsie Swain is lucky to have her as a teacher. Congratulations on behalf of HCA Florida. Thank you for your commitment to our students, to education, to inspiring the next generation in, in Palm Beach County. Well, we are so appreciative for you every single day. Oh, so thank yeah. you so much. I'm still overwhelmed. I feel privileged to have been recognized. It's just a privilege beyond belief. I just can honestly say that I love getting up and going to work every day. Hey, Palm Beach County, who will you nominate next? Thank you. So that's going to end my comments. Um, every monthly meeting, we honor the memory of our employees who have passed away. And so tonight, we remember Dwayne Isles, a teacher learning team facilitator at Glade Central High School. Dwayne was born July 27, 1961, and he passed away February 19, 2024. James Kengel was a technician to maintenance and maintenance and plant operations. He was born November 13, 1957, and passed away on March 1, 2024. So I'll ask all of you to please give a moment of silence for these employees. Thank you. So that's now going to bring us to unfinished business, which we don't have any. And we're going to move right on to, I'm sorry, that was out of order, but we're going to move right on to the item that has been now moved up, which is BRD1, the posthumous proclamation for Dr. Arthur Anderson. Mr. Ferguson. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I want to um, 
mention to the audience and those who may be watching online that Dr. Arthur Anderson uh, recently passed away uh, March 10th of 2024, but he was actually on this very uh, day as, as a board member from the years 1986 to 1994. Um, and like my good friend, uh, Ms. Andrews, Mrs. Andrews, Dr. Robinson, and also uh, Mr. Dan Hendricks, who was definitely the forerunner, I stand on your shoulders. So I wanna, at this time, recognize the good work of, of Dr. Anderson and let him know um, that he's missed. And I know his family is here. We're gonna deliver this proclamation to the family and some of his fraternal brothers as well. Um, so without any further ado, I'll read the proclamation, which reads as follows. Proclamation of the School Board of Palm Beach County, Florida. Proclamation number 24-03, April 17th, 2024. The School Board of Palm Beach County, Florida wants to recognize Dr. Arthur Anderson, who recently passed away, and to issue this proclamation. Whereas Dr. Arthur Washington Anderson was born in Spartanburg, South Carolina on February 22nd, 1941, and passed away on March 10th, 2024. And whereas Dr. Anderson moved to South Florida after periods of residing in Michigan and New York, he received a bachelor's degree in elementary education and a master's degree in guidance and counseling from Wayne State University. He earned his doctorate in higher education administration, institutional research, and student personnel from Michigan State University. And whereas Dr. Anderson was initiated into Alpha Upsilon chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity, incorporated on August 17, 1962, and later became an active member of Delta Delta Lambda chapter in West Palm Beach, and whereas Dr. Anderson was elected Palm Beach County Supervisor of Elections in August 2004, making him the first African-American elected to a constitutional office in the county. And whereas Dr. Anderson was the first African-American to serve as chairman of the Palm Beach County School Board and the first African-American to serve on the Florida Prepaid Post-Secondary Education Finance Board, and whereas Dr. Anderson was affiliated, affiliated with several community organizations and was elected president of the Palm Beach County Caucus of Black Elected Officials for 2007 through 2008. Success Magazine named him one of the 50 most powerful and influential black professionals in South Florida. And whereas Dr. Anderson received numerous awards and recognitions, such as the Distinguished Professor Award from Florida Atlantic University College of Education, and whereas Dr. Anderson founded the Florida Africa Trade Development Council and was involved in business development in Ghana, Zaire, Liberia, South Africa, and Brazil, and whereas Dr. Anderson made many charitable and community service contributions, including the founding of Mission to Liberia, which established an agricultural training school in Liberia, West Africa, that welcomed 200 students on its opening day. And whereas Dr. Anderson was a community leader, devoted family man, and educator who helped children from all over the world. Now, therefore, the school board of Palm Beach County, Florida proclaims that the foregoing recitals are true, correct, and incorporated into this proclamation by this reference. The school board wishes to honor and recognize posthumously Dr. Arthur Anderson for his many contributions to the Palm Beach County community. This proclamation shall take effect on the 17th day of April, 2024. The School Board of Palm Beach County, Florida, a corporate body politic. So at this time. No, uh, motion, please. I'd like to get a motion by Mrs. Andrews, second by Mrs. Whitfield. All in favor, all opposed, motion carries unanimously. And so now at this time, oh, we're gonna have everybody go down on the floor to also welcome Dr. Anderson's family and whoever wants to come up and join us. School board members, please stay down there on the floor because we will then move into our presentations.
Okay, thank you very much. And now I'm going to ask Ms. Neka Nolim from our Communications and Engagement Department to lead us with our presentations. Good evening, Chair Brill, Vice Chair McQuinn, Board members, Superintendent Burke, staff, and community members. And this evening we have five recognitions on the agenda. Uh, we begin with a recognition for Ruben, Ruben Arias, a custodian at Elbridge Gale Elementary School. A few months ago, a student, Liam Adler, was eating lunch at the school and unfortunately began choking. Uh, Mr. Arias acted quickly. He successfully performed the Heimlich maneuver and saved Liam's life. After being seen in the clinic, Liam was able to return to class. Mr. Arias has worked in the district for five years. His presence on campus is valued by staff and students, and it fills him with gratitude to know that he is appreciated. He is glad that he was there at the right moment to help Liam, and he will continue to be a caring adult at a school who was always willing to help in any way possible. The school board is proud to recognize Ruben Arias for his heroic, life-saving actions. And we also just want to acknowledge uh, Ms. Gail Pasterchik, the Principal at Elbridge Gale, Vivian Green, the Instructional Superintendent for the Central Region, and Valerie Zuloaga Haynes, Central Region Superintendent. Uh, and at this time, we want to welcome Miss Jenny Adler, Liam's mother, who would like to say a few words. Uh, Miss Adler, please come to the podium, and let's also give a big round of applause for Ruben Arias. I, can I cannot find the words to express my eternal gratitude to Mr. Ruben Arias for saving my son's life back in November the 2023. My son started choking, and by the time Mr. Arias reached Leon, he had turned purple and was near minutes away from being suffocated to death. Thank you, Mr. Arias for your quick thinking and performing the Heinrich maneuver which saved his life. All the staff need to be training, educated, and first aid and CPR to prevent situations like this to happening again. The poster hanging on the wall to instruct how to do a Heinrich maneuver did not work because the staff did not have the training skills or knowledge to provide life-saving measures when needed. I'm asking again to a school district and members of the school board to implement a mandatory CPR and first aid course, hands-on four-hour certification and training course to educate all staff personnel as a launch staff and teachers because our children eat in their classroom. Let us do better for our children. Help us saving a life. It could be your child. Thank you.
Next, we are recognizing Neighborhood Farms USA for their donation of $10,900 for the installation and revitalization of a food forest on the campus of Rolling Green Elementary School. In addition to supporting access to healthy food and nutrition education, Rolling Green Elementary's Garden in Initiative is dedicated to providing their students with enriching educational experiences that go beyond the conventional classroom setting. The contribution from Neighborhood Farms USA is both visionary and inspiring, as it will create a project-based learning opportunity that bridges the worlds of STEM education and the natural environment. By embracing the potential of gardens and food forests as learning ecosystems, they are not only imparting valuable knowledge, but also fostering a profound connection with nature, as well as sustainable living practices and access to healthy food. This donation represents an important collaborative relationship between Rolling Green Elementary and Neighborhood Farms USA that will further strengthen the school's ability to achieve their goals in the area of learning, nutrition, and the environment. The district is very grateful and appreciative for this donation. Here to accept this recognition, we have Michelle Card, Executive Director at Neighborhood Farms USA, and we also want to acknowledge Allison Manning, Principal at Rolling Green Elementary, Alan Geppert, a STEM teacher at the school as well, uh, Allison Monblu, Director School Food Service, Charlene Young, Manager, School Food Service, Janine Rizzo, School Guardian Strategist, School Food Service, and Jessica Zunker, a program, program planner in secondary education. Let's give them all a round of applause. Next, we are recognizing the district's Adult and Community Education Department for being awarded the 2024 Program Succeed When Le Learners Lead incentive grant in the amount of $2,000 from the Coalition on Adult Basic Education, the leading national organization dedicated to advancing the field of adult literacy. Jennifer Sherwin, the Adult Education Coordinator for the Adult and Community Education Program at Highlands Elementary School, started a project where her ESOL students developed an extension of their class by creating conversation groups to encourage their English skills out in the community. This program will model what the students learn in class. Each week, a relevant topic will be posted and community members will be able to join and discuss with each other in English. Topics will include American culture and lifestyle, cultural comparisons, how-to advice, community resources, and American systems within government and schools. Students will hold these table talks in a centralized, convenient location within their neighborhoods, preferably at the library or community centers. The aims of the group are to increase overall English-speaking proficiency in the community and to give current community members a place to connect. Congratulations to Adult and Community Education and Jennifer Sherwin for receiving the 2024 Program Succeed When Learners Lead Incentive Grant. Here to accept the recognition, we have Ms. Sherwin, of course, as well as Fred Barch, Director of Adult and Community Education, Francis Fry, Principal at Highlands Elementary, Lisa Anderson, Beginning Literacy Specialist, Sherry Bedwell, Adult and Community Education Specialist, and Mary Romero Rodriguez, Adult Education Teacher. Let's give them all a round of applause.
Next, we are recognizing Eileen Camposeco and Dr. Meiti Gomez, two science teachers at Lake Worth Community High School, who each received the 2024 Making a Difference Science Mentor of the Year Award. The award is given by Stiles Nicholson and the Cox Science Center to honor teachers for their dedication to their students. They have both been working to strengthen the science research program at Lake Worth High for several years. Each year, they have increased the number of students involved in science research and have always brought those students to the Palm Beach Regional Science and Engineering Fair. This year, their efforts paid off with five of the 10 students competing, earning awards for their exceptional research. Ms. Camposeco has been teaching in the district for five years. Her passion for teaching motivated her pursuit of a career in education. She says that her students keep her going because she can count on them to brighten up her day. Dr. Gomez has been teaching in the district for eight years. She has always been interested in the care and preservation of the environment, which led to her career as a science teacher. She finds it immensely rewarding and gratifying to work with students and help them achieve their goals. And we also want to acknowledge Elena Villani, the principal at Lake Worth High, and Jennifer Davis, the program planner, secondary science teaching and learning. Congratulations to Eileen Camposeco and Dr. Meiti Gomez for each receiving the 2024 Making a Difference Science Mentor of the Year Award. Let's give them a round of applause. And lastly this evening, we are recognizing the finalists for Beginning Teacher of the Year and Mentor Teacher of the Year at the elementary and secondary level, and also announcing the winner in each category. Now the finalists don't know who the winners are, so we're all gonna find out together, and it will be a lovely surprise. So uh, the Beginning Teacher of the Year Award is presented annually to an outstanding first year teacher in the district who has been recommended by their principal for demonstrating excellence. The award was created to honor beginning teachers' dedication and hard work. We'd like to recognize this year's finalists and ask them to please come forward as I call your name and then we will announce the winner. So for beginning teacher of the year at the elementary level, congratulations to the finalists, Nancy Alvarado from Pioneer Park Elementary, Miranda Gerritsen from Dwight D. Eisenhower K-8, <laughs> Ashley Inoa Grion from Hagen Road Elementary, <laughs> and Savannah Krill from Elbridge Gale Elementary. And we also want to acknowledge the principals from each of these schools, Dr. Sandra Moreau at Pioneer Park, Dr. Debbie Battles at Dwight D. Eisenhower K-8, Bernadette Standish at Hagen Row Elementary, and Gail Pasterchik at Elbridge Gale Elementary. Yes, great job by all the finalists. Okay, drum roll please. And the beginning teacher of the year at the elementary level is Ashley Inoa Grion from Hagen Road Elementary School.
Now we want to recognize this year's finalist for beginning teacher of the year at the secondary level. Please come forward as I call your name and then we will announce the winner. Congratulations to the finalists, Jessica Levitsky from Jupiter Community High. <laughs> Haley Schmidt from Eagles Landing Middle. <laughs> Patriana Vickers from Glade Central Community High. <laughs> and Annalise Wellman from Okihili Middle. And we also want to acknowledge the principals from each of those schools, Dr. Colleen Ioniti at Jupiter Community High, Dominic Rosati at Eagles Landing Middle, Melanie Bolden-Morris at Glade Central Community High, and Elizabeth Morales at Okahili Middle. All right. All right, you ready? So the beginning teacher of the year at the secondary level is Jessica Levetsky from Jupiter Community High School. Now we move on to the Mentor Teacher of the Year Award, which is presented annually to an outstanding first year mentor teacher in the school district. The award was created to acknowledge how mentor teachers support new educators through nurturing and teamwork. So we're gonna start with the Mentor Teacher of the Year at the elementary level. To the finalists, please come forward as I call your name and then we will announce the winner. Congratulations to Alexa Guy from Pleasant City Elementary School. Jill McLeod from Meadow Park Elementary. Amanda Morial from Sunrise Park Elementary. And Ray White from Glade View Elementary. And of course, we also want to acknowledge the principals from those schools, Adrian Griffin at Pleasant City Elementary, Kelly Patrick at Meadow Park Elementary, Kristen Menschel at Sunrise Park Elementary, and Chandra Dowers at Gladeview Elementary. All right, here we go. So the mentor teacher of the year at the elementary level is Alexa Guy from Pleasant City Elementary.
And last but not least, we want to recognize this year's finalists for Mentor Teacher of the Year at the secondary level. Those finalists, please come forward as I call your name, and then we will announce the winner. Congratulations to Stephen Annand from Dreyfus School of the Arts. <laughs> Molly Bongiovi from Royal Palm School. <laughs> and Judy Warren from Wellington Landings Middle School. And we also want to acknowledge the principals from those schools, Blake Bennett at Dreyfus School of the Arts, Dr. Jennifer Corcoran at Royal Palm School, and Lindsay Ingersoll at Wellington Landings Middle. All right, so the Mentor Teacher of the Year at the secondary level is Judy Warren from Wellington Landings Middle School. Madam Board Chair, Madam Vice Chair, Board Members, Superintendent Staff, and Members of the Community, this concludes the recognitions for April. Thank you everyone for your attention this evening. Okay, board members, that's going to move us now to the student government report, and I will turn to Faisal Abadawi for the report. Good evening, Superintendent Burke, Madam Chair, Vice Chair McQuinn, members of the board, and valued members of the general public. It feels good to be back. I unfortunately have had to miss the past two board meetings due to being under the weather, but I'm here now. Firstly, I'm ecstatic to be here with updates regarding the Association of Student Council's progress on our county project, Palm Beach Against Hunger. Over the past few months, I've been meeting the representative from the nonprofit No Kid Hungry. We discussed a roadmap to enhance student comfort comfortability and initiated plans such as speaking uh, to No Kid Hungry's partners in hopes of orchestrating a county-wide student-ran food drive in the future. Additionally, we explored expanding our project through flyer production and distribution to increase participation in school meals. It was also agreed upon to convene in collaboration with the director of Palm Beach County School Food Service to author and publish a student survey. The survey will not only gauge opinions regarding the meals themselves, but will also be the first ever to examine other factors contributing to a lack of participation in school meals, such as the setup of lunch lines, granted time frames, frames and any stigma surrounding school meals. 
This data will be invaluable as the county examines ways to increase participation and accommodate more students. At this point, we are slightly behind schedule, but progress on this project will not fade. Even after my term ends here on the school board, I'm committed to continue my involvement and participation in causes like the ones we've been able to shed light on throughout this year. A few weeks ago, the Association of Student Councils hosted their annual Senior Field Day, Anything Goes, at Jupiter High School. I'd like to recognize the Student Government Association of Jupiter High for their hard work and preparation and ensuring that the day was filled with fun, engaging, and enlightening activities. Furthermore, just tomorrow, we'll be hosting the annual county banquet. At tomorrow's banquet, the Association of Student Councils will elect the new county executive board for the next school year. I'd like to wish all candidates luck and hope that whoever is picked to represent Palm Beach's student body will further expand and implement the change that we've historically created together this past year. To tie into the leadership discussion, I've had the opportunity to meet with the CEO of Philanthropy Tanks, Ms. Amy Brand. The Association of Student Councils partnered with Philanthropy Tanks to promote the Student Focused Leadership Summit in the beginning of April at Kaiser University. The summit provided students a day-long schedule filled with leadership opportunities, seminars from renowned leaders, and even working alongside student leaders who've created their own nonprofit organizations. I'd also like to recognize West Boca High School Student Government Association and the County Executive Board for their preparation in putting on the District 5 rally. I'm glad to share that it was a great success where we hosted many schools countywide. I'd also like to recognize our guest speakers at the time, a board member, Ms. Erica Whitfield, who addressed exactly what those student leaders were eager to combat, hunger nationally, but more importantly, here at home in Palm Beach. I'd also like to thank our second guest speaker, Brittany Sinich, the founder of the Unbreakable Organization, discussing gun violence in schools, as seen on BBC, TED Talks, and more, in pursuit of gathering support and resources for our edu educational community. In closing, I'm incredibly proud of the progress that we are making in our countywide initiatives, and I look forward to seeing the positive impact that they will have on our community. Hearing positive feedback from our county administrators, teachers, parents, and students, we know that this is the definite beginning of strong impact led by students for years to come. Thank you for your attention and your continued support. Thank you, Mr. Abu Dhabi. So that's going to bring us over to the, the committee reports. Um, we do not have an academic advisory report today. Um, we also do not have an audit committee report. The Construction Oversight Review Committee report is attached to your agenda. Um, I'll now call up Juan Pagan, Chair of the District Diversity and Equity Committee, to deliver their report. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. The board meeting took place on of, uh, April 17, 2024, the DC report for the March 28 DDEC meeting. Good evening, Chair, Ms. Karen Brill, Vice Chair, Ms. Barbara McQueen, Board Members, Superintendent Mike Burt. The DC meeting on Tuesday, on Thursday, March 28, at the meeting, Mr. Oswald gave an update of, on the awarding of a Stronger Connections grant. This grant will support school attendance, student voice work at the schools, and strengthening SBT. Director Paul Hoshins gave a presentation on the CLT, Classic Learning Test. He shared results students are having from using this assessment for graduation. Results were promising to assist many students, especially those needing math requirements. Presentations were given by the following DDEC committee agencies, the Guatemala Maya, Maya Center, Mariana Blanco, Volunteer Association and Fund Fauna Florida, VAFF, Carleen Paul. Each agency spoke, spoke person shared presentation and information about each of the organizations. They share their purpose and priorities and how they support our students, families, and communities. The presentations were given very informative as each agency is unique on its own way. The goal of this presentation is for each of the members to network with each other to leverage the resources to support each other and the community. An update given by Kimberly Spire O, 
chair of the DDEC ad hoc subcommittee. The immediate focus of the ad hoc subcommittee is to create plan of action to present to the board regarding successful black male students, SBMS, in our schools. The DDEC committee voted to recommend these recommendations to be taken to the board and request that the board and superintendent take action on this recommendation. The board has a copy of this recommendation in their email coming from me. You should have received a hard copy on the, of the recommendation as well. In summary, the recommendation support steps to showcase, showcase successful black male students through their stories, professional development for principals, and other staff on ways to support SBMS, creation of a database of organizations that support SBMS and PD on how to enhance the learning environment for SBMS from the classroom to school-wide initiative. Again, the DDEC is recommending that the board and superintendent take steps to implement these recommendations that will support SBMS and all students. Do to bring in your child to work day, that is scheduled for Thursday, April 25th, the DDEC committee next meeting will be on Wednesday, April 24th at 10 o'clock in the morning. Thank you very much. Buenas noches. Thank you. General Counsel, do you have a report for us? No report, thank you. Thank you, and Inspector General, do you have a report? No report. Okay, thank you. So that's going to move us now to our elected officials and delegates. First, we will start with James Gravillis, President and CEO of the Education Foundation. Good evening, Board Chair Brill, Superintendent Burke, and members of the school board. I first want to commend our Chief of Communication for reminding us that April is Military Child Month, and we wear purple today as a proud Air Force dad. Uh, we, we salute those who serve and, and those who remain behind. And Ed Tierney, you're, you're never an ex-Marine, you're a former Marine, so we celebrate all those who serve. I'm going to keep it short tonight because I have the checks and the school supplies that we're awarding the winners of the beginning and mentor teacher of the year, so I want to commend you for that. Uh, a couple of quick points. I want to thank uh, board member Whitfield and our foundation board member uh, for taking half of my board report tonight. <laughs> uh, the building is progressing nicely. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, on May 1st, so just about two weeks from now, we will celebrate what's called a topping ceremony. Uh, they're going to put the roof on the building, and then all construction moves inside. We're going to have the chance to write our names on one of the beams that will go up into the roof. That will begin about 11.30. Uh, Proctor Construction is going to have a bit of a reception for their subcontractors. And then our, our own foundation board and major donors will gather. And again, all are welcome to join us for the topping ceremony on May 1st. Uh, Friday is our annual Bill Malone Golf Classic, and we want to thank Joe Sanchez, Dave Dolan, and all of the school district people who have made this such a success. Uh, if you get a chance to come out and greet some of our corporate partners or many of our contractors and school district uh, vendors will be participating, and you'll get to see Jim Moore, our chairman, in his fuchsia golf pants. Um, tomorrow night is also a shout out to the Sunrise Boca Raton Rotary Club as they celebrate the 28th Teacher of the Year. Uh, where they honor one nominee from all of the 23 schools in Boca Raton. It really is a beautiful evening, and I, I need to say something. This event came about 28 years ago when a member of that Rotary Club, a young rising star in the Boca Raton business community, a hotshot young attorney, a hotshot young <laughs> clean-shaven attorney <laughs> named Frank Barbieri, who apparently has changed his name to Ernest Hemingway, but... Uh, when a young hotshot attorney named Frank Barbieri got the Rotary Club together and said, we need to do this. And so tomorrow night, Frank, for the 28th time, uh, we will honor the Teachers of the Year down in Boca Raton. For the final minute or so of my report, I want to boil it down to sort of one kid, one program. Uh, you hear me talk about a lot of the things we do. Through the Frederick DeLuca Foundation, for the last four years, we've been sponsoring the cybersecurity program at Santa Lucia's High School. The DeLuca Foundation contributed $750,000, three quarters of a million dollars, to get this program up. And we did a site visitation about a week and a half ago. Now, for the last few months, my program director, who many of you know, Jennifer Etheridge, has been insisting that we've had a breach in our security, and there's a bug in the outlook, and I just kind of, yeah, whatever, I don't have a problem. We go to do this cybersecurity visit, and one of these 15-year-old kids does this. Miss Jennifer, do you know that your emails on the dark web on a compromised site that's being sold to other people? A 15-year-old kid caught what Microsoft didn't. 
These kids at Santa Lucia's are first class, and they are receiving a first class education. Through funding from the DeLuca Foundation, we at the Ed Foundation have made a decision. We're actually hiring two of them this summer as summer interns. We're gonna take two kids from Santa Lucia's High School from the cybersecurity program. We're gonna hire them. We're gonna pay them to come in and teach us what the geniuses out in Seattle can't figure out how to do, but the kids at Santa Lucia's High School did. Superintendent Burke, these are the kind of academies that you have under your care and supervision. These children are not only receiving a world-class education, they are world-class kids. And we are so uh, honored to partner with the Frederick DeLuca Foundation in that program. And quite honestly, we're pretty darn uh, proud to hire these kids this summer to straighten out our security issues. Ladies and gentlemen, we are your education foundation. Have a great evening. Thank you. Claudia Kirk Bartow, President of Junior Achievement of Palm Beach and Treasure Coast. Is she here? Mm -hmm. Okay. Good evening, Chairman Brill, Vice Chair McQuinn, um, Board Member, Superintendent Burke. Um, I'm Claudia Kirk Barto, President of Junior Achievement of the Palm Beaches and Treasure Coast, and I do apologize. I got called out for missing a couple meetings, but my daughter had a track meet, so I apologize um, for not being here and not letting you all know. Um, so I'm here today and happy Volunteer Appreciation Month. I just wanted to start with sharing about our high school heroes and college champions because we have so many young people that are volunteering and that's over 3,300 community service hours those young people got by going into the schools to teach other young people our junior achievement program. So that's 373 high school heroes so far this year from schools like Glade Central. Next week, they'll be going to Pioneer Park, um, Palm Beach Gardens High School, Park Vista High School, Green um, John A. Leonard, Jupiter High School, Palm Beach Lakes. And there are also clubs within those schools, so Latinos in Action, sometimes it's the student government, um, the Key Club, they're the ones together as a group that are going to those feeder elementary schools. So it's super cool um, to see. It's really neat when they embrace the program and even start interpreting like the John A. Leonard students did when they went to the elementary school. They were um, changing our program and using it um, dual language style. So that's really neat to see as well. Um, they're taking it to the next level. And they've reached, those 373 students reached almost 4,000 students this year at the elementary school level. So that is awesome. And there are two, two teachers I just want to give a shout out. They've been doing it forever. That's Zondell Morris at Palm Beach Lakes and Karen Cumberland at Palm Beach Gardens High School. So they are amazing and continue to work with us every year. Our college champions, about 107 of them reached about almost 1,000 students at as well, and they're nursing students from Kaiser and the education students from Palm Beach Atlantic. So I just wanted to recognize them. And then we have volunteers from over 100 different organizations that are volunteering with, throughout our community. So far, we've documented 500, but by the end of the year, we'll have over 1,000 other volunteers that come from different organizations. So next week, I'm, I'm sorry, tomorrow, we'll be at Westgate, and that's the clerk and comptroller for Palm Beach County, Wells Fargo, Comcast, along with those high school heroes from Palm Beach Lakes that will be there. So we really love that. And happy Earth Month. I can't miss that. We'll be celebrating Earth Week next week um, because of the marine industries um, and Palm Beach International Boat Show Gives Back, Keep Palm Beach County Beautiful and Waste Management. We have five speakers the owner of Albury Brothers, um, Windpipe Labs, Loxahatchee River District, Manatee Lagoon, Florida Oceanographic Society, and the PBSO Marine Unit. And we'll have five live views, virtual field trips. We'll be seen over 19,000 times so far next week. That is a ton of work. And we'll end it all with a beach cleanup with the student-led organization, Surface 71 on the 27th, so you'll hear more about that when the other Bartow speaks in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Gordon Longhofer, CTA President. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Brill. Uh, good evening, Chair Brill, Vice Chair McQuinn, Superintendent Burke, members of the board, and honored guests. I am Gordon Longhofer, President of the Classroom Teachers Association. The end of the school year is approaching, and with it, the time when each of our sides will sit down to bargain the next salary contract for teachers. As I consider this, I remember well the agreement reached last September. Even now, I continue to characterize it as a good start. Why just a good start? Well, teachers have seen its impact in their paychecks, and it's given them hope, um, a hope for something even better going forward. They've told me as much in the many conversations I've had with them in schools this year. And to their credit, the reality of still needing to work second jobs uh, to meet their ever-increasing expenses to live each day has in fact not muted that hope. Their hope is not muted because they understand all too well this simple truth. The single most important factor impacting student achievement in schools is a highly qualified teacher engaging those students in learning each and every day. With the education climate as it is in Florida, now more than ever, we must keep a full teaching staff for every school as the front and center priority of the district budget. Because I believe that, I am always pained to hear phrases like, that only leaves us this amount of money for raises. You see, teachers count on those annual raises to meet their ever-increasing expenses, and we're talking about expenses that they really can't pick and choose from. Rent, food, transportation, utilities, health care. When we consider that there remains about five months until the final budget adoption for next school year, clearly you have time and that is uh, time to prioritize the teaching staff for our students at the highest level and start to build back what they've lost in these inflationary times. Therefore, I ask you to do exactly that. Prioritize teachers in the budget, show them their value, turn their hope to reality. In so doing, you will enable them to do with passion and 100% of their workday effort every day the one job they desire to do most leading their students to excel each and every day so that they can claim their hope for a more successful and fulfilling life. Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you. Dr. Deborah Robinson, Coalition for Black Student Achievement. Is she here? Is Dr. Deborah Robinson here? Okay. So... On behalf of the entire school board, I'd like to welcome any public speakers who are joining us today. Please address the school board as a collective body and do not address individual board or staff members directly. Our policy provides that we do not respond to or engage with our speakers. However, we do make note of your issues and we follow up with district administration regarding them. As a reminder, Public comments must relate to the subject matter of the agenda item which the speaker has requested to address. Pursuant to school board policy, speakers whose comments do not relate to the topic that the speaker indicated, including but not limited to the mention of any person's candidacy, candidacy for elected office, or whose comments disrupt or interfere with the order of the meeting, may be subject to removal from the meeting or having the microphone turned off and forfeiting the right to speak at the remainder of today's meeting. Again, your attendance here at the school board meeting is truly appreciated. So we're now going to move to our agenda topic speakers. You will have three minutes to address the board. In accordance with school board policy, the microphone will be turned off when the time limit has been reached. And when you speak, please state your name for the record. We also request that you provide your address, school district number, or city of residence. And so I just, again, want to say thank you very much for joining us. I'm going to call two people at a time. I apologize in advance for any names that I mispronounce. So the first two speakers are Ethan D'Agostino and Nikolai Dukiewicz. If you will please come up to the microphone. Yes. Okay, please state your name. Hello, my name is Ethan D'Agostino. Uh, I will be representing Palmy Central High School and I'm speaking as a student voice for the Climate Coalition. I would like to speak to you about a day's worth of plastic use in our school, which was accounted by my plastic uses. 
Every breakfast item is contained in plastic baggies for a grab-and-go meal, with each individual item inside these pre-made baggies being made of plastic as well. During lunch, there are a multitude of vending machines with every item inside containing single-use plastics. Additionally, every, li every line meal will use single-use plastics from the styrofoam trays all the way to the utensils. Transitioning to after-school activities like football, the vending machines outside offers only plastic and aluminum sport drinks. All of this plastic is single use and will end up in the trash at the end of days. And as president of Environmental Honor Society and a varsity football captain, I know our school participated in Recycle Rights Mania, which is a recycling competition to divert plastics from one football game. The results from our homecoming game was a total of 634 gallons of diverted plastics from landfills. With this, our school placed third, while the first place school diverted 100 gallons more. This competition opened my eyes, as it should for all of you, as to how much plastic is actually used in a single football game. And comparing a three hour long football game to an eight hour day at school, the game holds half the number of people at school, as a school does, but, produces, but still produces a large quantity of single use plastics. This heightened my attention to the issue of single use plastics in our school, and one thing the school district can improve upon is the availability of water bottle refilling stations. At Palm Beach Central, we only have one that is accessible to students. And it's only accessible during limited hours of the day. And still, the current refill stations has saved over 50,000 bottles. And adding more will encourage the use of reusable cups. I do, however, recognize that they are not cheap, as they cost $1,300 each. But the investment will save our school from single-use plastics. Another way we could reduce usage of plastic waste during the school day would be to use more sustainable items during lunchtime. Currently, we are using styrofoam trays and plastic baggies. Instead, our county schools should shift into paper trays, biodegradable plastic utensils, and paper baggies. These alternatives are more sustainable and better than the current ones that we are using. Lastly, implementing these tools can help encourage environmental stewardship on campus. Teachers and students would be more aware of their actions during the day, which can have a positive impact on our community. Even though the change may be slow, the smallest changes, even at a single school, can make a big impact in reducing single-use plastics. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Nikolai Dukevich. I am a senior at Dreyfus School of the Arts, and I'm a part of the Palm Beach County Climate Coalition. Uh, sustainability is a topic that is more relevant today than ever before. In our current world, we are facing a population influx where resources will be reduced, and the delicate line between man and nature will become more tense. One way to combat the effects and alleviate this tension can begin with education that's implemented in our schools. By implementing sustainable efforts and teaching our students about ways they can contribute uh, productively to sustainability, we will lessen the strain and we will have on our environments. Living in South Florida, we get most of our water from the Everglades. The Everglades is a unique ecosystem found nowhere else on Earth, making it even more important to protect. Surprisingly, in our state, teaching the vital importance and role of the Everglades is not required, yet it needs to be. At Dreyfus, we are committed to conserving our water and informing our students about the vital role the Everglades plays. In December of 2023, we had Alyssa Saldriaga from the Everglades Literacy Program come to our school and speak with the students about the Florida watershed. Both uh, and <laughs> in this presentation, we went over uh, where our, water, our state's water comes from and the strain we put on the Everglades. After this presentation, we installed rain barrels and a drip irrigation system in our school gardens. This process of installing and presenting our projects has not only raised awareness for our student body on water sustainability, but it also prompted and motivated them to pursue sustainable efforts at home. A great way to get students involved and excited about sustainability is through gardening. Gardening is an engaging and rewarding way for students to be involved in the community. Native gardens involve care and work that engages students and reiterates the idea of sustainability. South Florida is home to a unique array of beautiful wildflowers and plants. If we were to put native foliage in all of our campuses instead of sod and non-native species, we would beautify our school campuses as well as contribute to the biodiversity of Florida. Uh, the native plants also provide habitats for native species. On the Dreyfus campus, we have multiple Kunti plants where we have spotted Atala caterpillars on them. 
Atala caterpillars are offspring of the, uh, of the Atala butterfly, which is a native species that is endangered. Through our efforts are promising, there is more we can do. By uh, instilling sustainability into our schools, cultures, via curriculum and extracurricular activities in our campuses, we all become active stewards of our home state and the environment at large. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Marina Barto and Isil Nira. Good evening, Chairman Brill, Vice Chair McQuinn, board members, and Superintendent Burke. Happy Earth Week. My name is Marina Barto, and I'm a member of the Student Climate Coalition. I'm a junior at Alexander W. Dreyfus School of the Arts. I attended Coniston and South Olive Elementary. I'm also the president of the student-led nonprofit Surface 71, with, board, with a board of students from multiple high schools. Surface 71 is committed to making a positive impact on our ecosystem through the refusal, reduction, and elimination of single-use plastics. Surface 71 was born as an IB service learning project at Coniston Middle School in 2016. And in 2018, science teacher Stephanie Killingsworth encouraged the founders, Gemma Curry and Emily Braseno, to apply to Philanthropy Tank so they had the funding to expand the project. With Philanthropy Tank funding, our first initiative were to install, in, install LK water refill stations in local public schools in partnerships with the principals of each school and a liaison in the school district sustainability department. The first schools were Coniston Middle School, of course, Suncoast, Forest Hill, and Palmetto Elementary. And since then, we have expanded to 10 schools. At Palmetto Elementary, we hosted a ribbon cutting, and we were able to educate their students on the importance of clean waters and the harm of plastic bottles by encouraging them to bring reusable water bottles to school. I have seen how helpful these water stations are as I get feedback from students on our board weekly. One, of, one thing I have heard is that students want more stations that Surface 71 alone cannot supply. These stations include encourage students to bring their own water bottles and stay hydrated throughout the day. The district has installed many water refill stations and maintained them, but the stations from outside organizations are not receiving that same care. I can speak from experience that some of the schools we install water refill stations at did not maintain their stations, which they agreed to do when the stations were installed. So Surface 71 with a grant supplied them with one additional filter to last them approximately two years. Now some schools have bought additional filters as promised, but my issue is with the future. Possibly a mandate to keep these stations up to date, or possibly additional funding allocated to schools with water refill stations. Another mission of Service 71 is education and awareness. As I mentioned, we have educated students at Pomel Elementary about the effect of plastic on the environment and ways they can help. I would love to see more education about sustainability, whether it becomes a part of the curriculum or a guest speaker like Surface 71 comes in during science class to educate about these topics. We also need student ambassadors as I am a junior and I need others to lead the organizations just like Emily and Gemma did when, I went off to, when they went off to college. Lastly, we have a beach cleanup coming up um, and we hope to see you there on the 27th. I know Mr. Ferguson has one, but if you can't make it, we would love, to we would love for you guys to come out um, and then check out Surface 71 on all social media platforms. Thank you. Thank you board members for hearing us today. So my name is Isel and I'm a senior at Suncoast Community High School. Outside of school, I'm a volunteer lobbyist at the Citizens Climate Lobby Organization as well as the founder of Climate Action Club at my school. I'm one of many students that the school district has helped raise. As I've transitioned from a child at New Horizons Elementary to a teen at Wellington Landings Middle and now a young adult at Suncoast, the school district has been a central force in my upbringing. Now, as I transition into adulthood, I'm scared of what my future will look like in a world facing extreme climate change. I feel that the district not only has the duty to bring up our future generations, but also do its due diligence to help guarantee the future of kids like me.
The success of students goes hand in hand with the sustainable practices the district employs, and I feel there are substantial changes to be made. For starters, at Suncoast, students are offered free breakfast, lunch, and after school meals as long as they consume an entree, as well as a side, vegetable, and a drink. Students who, for example, only want a drink are then incentivized to also get an entree and side item in order for the meal to be free. The waste generated from students who get full meals but only eat an item or two of that meal is contributing to the waste of, the, of those foods as well as the plastic packagings they come in. And at schools like Suncoast, there are no designated places for students to leave leftover foods even if they wanted to. On top of this, plastic forks, knives, and spoons are used every day by students to eat every meal and then are immediately discarded. The same applies for the styrofoam trays used in my school's cafeteria. And my school has alone has more than a thousand students who are using the single-use plastics provided by the cafeteria every day. On a district-wide level, the amount of unnecessary waste being generated is concerning. Speaking on a longer timeline, the district's use of diesel school buses is also contributing to the overarching problem of climate change. A study by University of Michigan found that children riding inside diesel school buses may be exposed to four times the level of diesel exhaust as the cars in front of them. Not only does this harm students' health, but it also directly contributes to climate change by emitting air pollutants. The district's recent implementation of the necessary infrastructure for electric school buses is commendable and should be continued to be given the limelight. But further electrification of district infrastructures would be a step forward for reduced emissions. Most importantly, I speak for many students when I say that we want effective action that make the district more sustainable. Symbolic climate actions will not achieve the sustainability goals that we need. If the district wants to continue developing the future generations of professionals and contributing members of society, sustainability is utterly necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Austin McIntyre and Cecilia Badaferrano. Good evening, everyone. My name is Cecilia Badaferrano. I'm an eighth grade student at the Conservatory School at North Palm Beach. Next year, I will be attending Suncoast High School in the IIT program. I am Austin McIntyre, also a student at the Conservatory School in the eighth grade. My classmate and I came here today to address two issues, our concern about excessive consumption of plastics in our school cafeterias and our ideas for solutions that we believe will make a difference. Through extensive research, we have learned that when we use styrofoam and trays and single-use forks and spoons individually wrapped like these items that are served within our school cafeteria, they will, they will take approximately 500 years to decompose and often end up in our school, in our oceans and other ecosystems which will inevitably harm marine life and important organisms. To put this into perspective, th that means that it will take generations upon generations before these plastics are gone. Taking an initi initiative now means that we could save around six generations from plastic in our world. According, according to the Department of Environmental Quality, students pr schools produce around 30,000 pounds of plastic each year. If we then multiply that 30,000 pounds of plastic by the 227 schools in our district, we get over 3,000 tons of plastic we produce each year. When we were researching, we, found, we learned about the initiative called Plastics Free Lunch Day, established by the organiz organization Cafeteria Culture in New York. Through this initiative, school districts School, school districts commit to one day a month where, when no plastic or styrofoam is used and only finger foods, foods are served on compostable or reusable trays so that no plastic silverware is needed. The culture around being plastic free is so well supported that students do not bring plastic in their own lunch either. Our plan is to pilot a plastic free lunch day initiative at our school this upcoming Monday, April 22nd in honor of Earth Day. We strongly believe that we, this will not only reduce plastic waste at our school, but also educate and motivate younger students to take action on environmental issues such as overuse of plastic. By collaborating as a whole school, they will see that we can make a difference together if we commit to change. If successful, we hope that you may consider making this a district-wide in initiative. This one means selecting one day a month that is Plastic Free Lunch Day in our school district and supplying cafeteria school managers with supplies they need to avoid styrofoam and plastic. 
It would also mean promoting the importance of this initiative to all district stakeholders. Although Plastic Free one Lunch Day is one of our goals, we believe that plastic and styrofoam should be eliminated from all school cafeterias in the near future. These materials are unsustainable and, on and the only way... No, thank you very much. So to all of the students that were here tonight, on behalf of the school board, I just want to let you know how meaningful it is to all of us to hear your voices. The superintendent and staff are going to get back to us on your suggestions. You had some excellent, excellent suggestions, and I know it's not easy to come before us, so thank you again to all the students. Next, Victoria Parry and, and Cassandra Thades. Hi, I'm Victoria Perry from Palm Beach, and I am talking about the Jeff Bezos schools, and I want to know what makes Jeff Bezos want to start a school for toddlers, or any age children for that matter. Who is Jeff Bezos? Who does Jeff Bezos associate with? What does Jeff Bezos stand for? Jeff Bezos is someone who monopolized the retail market with Amazon, which destroyed and bankrupted many small businesses. Small business is the lifeblood of the American culture, by the way. Jeff Bezos reduced employment opportunities and treated employees as disposable. What makes Jeff Bezos an authority on molding our most precious children's minds. Our children are a gift from the Lord above, and they deserve to be protected, respected, and those influencing them seriously vetted. Thank you. Cassandra Thades and Adrian, and Adrian Smith. Good evening. Can you hear me? Oh. Good evening. Thank you. Superintendent Burke and members of the board. I am Dr. Cassandra Corbin Thaddeus, and I'm here to advocate for the proposal from the DDEC that focuses on intentionally supporting high academic achieving black male students to feel connected and develop a sense of belonging and establish trust within our school community. Before I delve into the proposal, I want to acknowledge an important clarification. The proposal refers to successful black male students, but it should read high academic achieving black male students as defined by my recent research. Uh, this terminology will be um, adjusted. In my recent, in my recent ph phenomenological research study conducted here in Palm Beach County, I had the privilege of interviewing black male students who are high academic achievers, defined as those with a GPA of 3.0 or higher. What emerged from their narrative, narrative was a strength-based perspective that highlighted the pivotal role of authentic relationships in their academic success. Specifically, these students emphasize the importance of love, support, and guidance from family and friends, as well as the profound impact of connected, caring, and authentic relationships with at least one of their teachers. So shout out to our teachers in classrooms. Additionally, the presence of at least one black male role model was instrumental in shaping their academic journey. Uh, a note, two counter uh, narrative notes. One, the majority of the students were from two-parent households, and two, the majority of the students were interested in careers in STEM, not sports. It's crucial to recognize that the successes of black male students extend beyond individual achievement. It has a ripple effect on, it, on the entire school district. Research such as the mixed method studies uh, conducted by Howard and McNair highlight several insights into the relationship between the high academic achievement of black male students and the overall school district performance. There are four. Number one, their achievement improves school climate. It increases student engagement and reduces disciplinary issues and increases morale. Second, they achieve, their achievement naturally closes the achievement gap, um, promoting true equity. Third, their achievement increases our graduation rates, benefiting the entire school district, and that includes student retention and a more educated workforce. 
Finally, when black males are high academic achievers here in Palm Beach County, it creates a positive community, community perception and inspires increased parental invo involvement. In conclusion, high academic achieving black males play a pivotal role in positively influencing the academic success of our district. Their achievement serves as inspiration and motivation for all students to strive for excellence by intentionally supporting them to feel connected, develop a sense of belonging, and establish trust within our community, we not only uplift individual students, but we also propel our entire... Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Smith? Good evening, Adrian Smith. Uh, topic of interest is uh, to discuss is the consent item FMPA 1, First Amendment to Agreement with Positive Behavior Supports Corporation, which is established uh, with the schools. Um, as it's stated here that uh, uh, they had a budget increase uh, this year under the description items here that I'm reading, that they have increased uh, the cor corporation up to 2595 hours 2000 hours. and uh in in regards to the uh, behavior support uh prospects i'd like to refer to the uh fbas uh which are concerning uh behavioral intervention plans and the bips for students and that's regarding the uh, behavior uh, analysis and I think what would be critical to since we have and I've discussed this before but there are a lot of uh, uh, juveniles that come in into the uh, schools and have issues with behavioral uh, issues re directly res resulting from uh, abuse that was sexual abuse as I discussed this last time and and I also discussed this last year, abuse from other students. I've brought this up to the board. I've brought up individual police reports and things like this. This is very common. And this will be a good uh, opportunity to address these things, but in the proper manner. And when I say the proper manner, that means we'll discuss these things in, in such that uh, students will derive where their problem stems from and that we direct them in, in, in the right manner to their um, uh, dealing with their situation. Uh, I shared with you before the last meeting a comment from uh, Dr. Martin Luther King uh, who had commented on, on a, a juvenile that had behavioral disruption uh, which was uh, commented by him that it was likely that it had come from a derivative of the culture or from abuse which is also very common. Uh, what I'd like to add is uh, uh, just as of yesterday, a, uh, uh, they have approved the item HB 931 for school chaplains has been approved. Uh, as of yes, went to the governor's desk yesterday. So now uh, the school can invite, as they have budget concerns, people from churches, you have an army of people out there available. I've been, I've done it five years myself, and now you have access. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, board members, that's going to move us into the consent agenda. I'll take a motion to approve the consent agenda motion by Mrs. Andrews, second by Mrs. Whitfield. Any discussion? All in favor, all opposed, motion carries unanimously. We do not have any unfinished business, so that will bring us, Mr. Superintendent, to CAO 4. I recommend the board approve the adoption of the list of instructional materials for the periods indicated and authorize the superintendent or designee to sign all related documents to the FY25 instructional materials program. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, second by Ms. Ayala. Any discussion? All in favor, all opposed, motion carries unanimously. CEW1. Yes, this is a public hearing item. We're not requesting any action tonight, but this was an opportunity if the public wished to come out and speak on our K-12 resiliency and life skills instructional materials. Um, this was made available. So we, we can move on to our next item, which is COM7. I'm going to turn the, the gavel over to Vice Chairman Quinn for this one. 
I recommend the board proclaim April 2024 as Autism Awareness and Acceptance Month. Is there a motion to approve? Mr. Ferguson and Marshall Andrews second. Motion passes. Thank you, 7-0. Seeing no objections. And now Chairwoman Brill will read the proclamation for um, the Autism Awareness. Thank you. So I'm going to preface this proclamation by saying that 32 years ago when I ad began advocating for people with autism in the school district, people, the, people were afraid of autism. Nobody really knew what to expect. And today when you speak to people, I can tell you that I would bet that everyone in this room either has someone in their family or knows someone or has a friend or knows somebody else that has that special gift because autism is a gift as you get to know these special, special people. So I'm going to read the proclamation for Autism, autism Awareness Month and Acceptance Month. Whereas autism spectrum disorder is a neurological difference that can affect anyone, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, or socioeconomic background. And whereas autism spectrum disorder affects one in 44 children in the United States and approximately 4,613 students in the school district of Palm Beach County as of 2022. Males are almost four times as likely to have autism spectrum disorder than females. And whereas autism spectrum disorder is estimated to be the fastest growing developmental disability in the United States, according to the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, and Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring, Monitoring ADDM, and whereas individuals with autism are individuals first and foremost with unique strengths and abilities, and whereas symptoms and characteristics of autism spectrum disorder present themselves in a variety of combinations and can result in lifelong impacts on the individual's ability to learn, develop relationships, and understand verbal and nonverbal communication. And whereas early diagnosis and intervention, as well as ongoing support from family, doctors, therapists, and educators can positively influence people with autism spectrum disorder to achieve better outcomes and a higher quality of life. And whereas people with autism spectrum disorder should have access to appropriate services throughout their lifetime so that they can achieve their greatest potential and lead happy and productive lives fully included within their communities. And whereas the district prides itself on being student-centered and a place where our schools and community are committed to developing programs and providing services that meet the diverse need, academic and social needs of all our students, including those with autism. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the superintendent and school board of Palm Beach County do hereby proclaim April 2024 as Autism Awareness and Acceptance Month and urge all personnel and students to participate in relevant activities in order to become better educated on the strengths and needs of those with autism spectrum disorder. Done this 17th day of April, 2024 in West Palm Beach, Florida. Thank you. So that's going to move us now to COM8. I recommend the board proclaim April 2024 as School Library Month. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, second by Mrs. Whitfield. Any discussion? All in favor, all opposed, motion carries unanimously. COM 9. I recommend the board proclaim April 22nd, 2024 is Earth Day. Motion by Ms. Ayala, second by Mrs. Whitfield. Any discussion? All in favor, all opposed, motion carries unanimously. COM 10. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I understand that you want to read the proclamation. I would, Madam Chair. After those students spoke so eloquently, I feel I owe it to them. Thank you. I was very impressed. Thank you. Whereas Earth Day serves as a reminder of our collective duty to safeguard the environment and promote sustainability, and whereas environmental stewardship is a responsibility shared by every individual, community, and organization, and whereas the School District of Palm Beach County is committed to promoting environmental education, conservation efforts, and sustainable practices within our schools and communities, and whereas education plays a vital role in fostering environmental awareness, inspiring action, and instilling a sense of environmental responsibility in our youth, and whereas the students, educators, and staff of the school district recognize the importance of preserving and protecting natural resources for future generations, 
and whereas the voices and actions of students are powerful agents for positive change and their engagement in environmental initiatives is vital for the future of our planet. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the superintendent and school board of Palm Beach County do hereby proclaim April 22nd, 2024 as Earth Day done the 17th day of April 2024 in West Palm Beach, Florida. Thank you. Thank you. And we've already voted unanimously. So that will bring us to COM 9. I'm sorry, COM 10. I recommend the board proclaim April 28th, 2024 as Gardens of Hope Awareness Day. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, second by Ms. Ayala. Any discussion? All in favor, all opposed, motion carries unanimously. P2. I recommend the school board approve the personnel addendum as submitted. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, second by Mr. Barbieri. Any discussion? All in favor, all opposed, motion carries unanimously. That will now bring us up to our non-agenda speakers. Okay, I'm gonna call you up two at a time. Carl Mohammed and Dwight Walton. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present myself. My name is Dwight L. Walton, Sr. I'm the founder of Apple Omega Biometrics, which we are the ANCA DCF approved awarded mobile vendor for level two background screening for the Palm Beach County School District. Florida Department of Education is working on a new platform to bring the background screening into the new, into the 21st century format. DOE was instructed by Florida governor with the full legislative voting of the Florida Senate and House to execute State Bill 2524, a full level two background screening for all employees, volunteers, vendors that serve students in K through 12 education in the state of Florida, private schools, charter schools, school of the arts, etc. The background screening will be developed in all schools in the state of Florida system, including employees, volunteers, and vendors. <clears throat> Excuse me. Per guidance of the Department of Education, the new background screening would be housed by the ARCA Clearinghouse under the guidance of the Department of Education. Each school and district in every school, K through 12 in the state of Florida, will be assigned an account to administer the process with the approved ARCA vendor. Apple Omega. Currently, the district, the district after school program and early childhood, we are fully vetted through the department's purchasing department and Office of Diversity and Business Practices. We are an approved vendor located in the state of Florida for ACA vendorship, transmitting the level two background screening directly to FDLE up in Tallahassee to keep the district in full compliance of DOE, DCF, and other state approved agencies. Palm Beach County School District employed 23,000 employees and volunteers, vendors that serve to ensure the highest education and safety environment level for all students in the county. Per guidance of the Department of Education, employees, volunteers, and vendors would need to be screened or rescreened in a new process. This, we are a, the district award, awarded approved vendor. We would like to provide our services to assist Palm Beach County School District with the screening of employees, vendors, volunteers to ensure full state appliance. We are looking forward to partnering with the district HR and police team to provide the highest level of service required by the Florida Department of Education. I'm leaving you with my information and the information about the state bill. Finally, we are providing service for Palm Beach County School District and the department that I spoke of earlier. Thank you. Okay. Brother Carl Muhammad. Carl Muhammad. First, let me say I'm glad to see everybody back after the Easter um, celebration. And I hope and pray that you would get some spirit as it relates to righteousness, as it relates to dealing with the children. And I hear tell tonight for the first time, two people came up and mentioned black children, black boys. But I want to remind the superintendent that we have a task force that's called the Superintendent Task Force for African-American Children, particularly the African-American male child. And as a result of we, us doing so much work, 
we have a lot of things that we have accomplished, but because of our neglect, we don't see the things and we keep starting over and over again. And I think we need to look at what we've already achieved. And when we talk about this is volunteer month, I think I got about 32 years continuously. Um, I think I'm about the, probably about the longest volunteer ever been seen in the history of Palm Beach County. And I come because I'm really interested in the well-being of our children who are not being mentioned. And we have a Florida law. Uh, Florida Statute 1003.428. We have achievement matters for all. We have the superintendent task force. We have um, all kind of training already prepared. And just like I um, shared with you, Ms. Andrews, we have a proposal for our churches because one of the things that we discovered as it relates to our relationship inside of the school district and the community, we discovered that our churches was to bring spirituality back into our community. So we have a plan for them as well. And we'd love for you to take a look at it so that you could bring the world of academia forward because we have seemed to be stagnant. And I see everybody still making progress, but we have in the past been identified as an exemplary um, district because of our efforts in doing things as it relates to dealing with um, the big, biggest problem in the state of Florida, and that is uh, black children. So I want to encourage everybody, and I know we are um, getting ready for the summer, and uh, every summer the piranhas come out, me, they come out and they clip off all of our little children, take them into different little things that are not beneficial for them, and the proof is always we have to come back the next year and start all over again. So we have hopes that possibly you might join along with our community. If you have anything of good that you're offering, we'd love to share um, with that. And we'd love to share with you with some of the things that we've developed as a community. And we have a whole host of stuff. And I got a whole, I mean, I got volumes. But I could also remember after 30 years before we had one word on a piece of paper here in Palm Beach County. So. I'm going to leave you with that, and once again, glad you're back, and pray that you will help us in some kind of meaningful way. Let us know um, out in the public, not in private. Let us know out in the public so we can get some energy, because we do need our boule, our, our fraternities, our Masonics, and everybody else to initially, I mean, to start getting involved. So we need you to kind of encourage them a little bit. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Daisy Daniel and Rena Rosenfeld. Good evening. My name is Daisy Daniel, employee number 109-8370. This is part three. I will pick up where I left off last month on March 13th. And now we have 52 school counselor positions open compared to 40 openings in February. This represents over 40,000 students not getting the services they need from a school counselor. And that is just what my eyes can see on the district search portal. I'm sure the problem is much graver than this. As of today, I searched, and there are now 69 school counselor positions that need to be filled, and 31 of those are elementary schools. Elementary school is where students are taught guidance, values, and character. The confusing thing is that I attended the job fair couple of weeks ago, and I specifically spoke to every principal that had a school counselor position open, and every single one of them said that it was filled. So if that's the case, why is it showing that there's so many school counselor still open on the portal? It's very confusing. The Florida statute. 1006.012 states that every school in the district should have a school counselor or counselors implementing a guidance program, not substitute teachers. Most substitutes are not school counselors or mental health professionals, yet they are the ones watching students that are supposed to be getting guidance taught to them. Why aren't steps being taken aside from the WAVES FAU scholarship, which I will talk at a future meeting, why aren't steps being taken to close the school counselor gap? With the teacher shortage, Governor DeSantis has allowed schools in Florida to hire military veterans. They can now teach and get certified while getting the salary of a teacher. 
Yet, this is not happening for the school counselor positions. This same process needs to occur with the school counselor shortage. Mental health professionals with bachelor degrees in psychology, social work, counseling need to be considered along with a teaching certificate for those teaching guidance in elementary school. If we're going to improve the large teacher and school counselor turnaround, as well as the escalating misbehavior of students left, right, and center, something needs to be done. We need to change the trajectory when it comes to the school. Thank you. My name is Rena Rosenfeld, and I come from the east end of Long Island. I will be talking about black facts, not fiction. Long Island is known for its charming villages, beautiful harbors, and gorgeous beaches. But behind these beautiful scenes is a cruel and violent history of enslaved, captured African people. These human beings were brought and sold, treated as property, close to 200 years living under horrific conditions legally. Slavery on Long Island was home to the largest population of enslaved people in the northern colonies. 25 minutes from my house is a slave plantation. I am a voluntary researcher for a project on the east end of Long Island called In Plain Sight. We are uncovering Long Island town's ties to slavery. The goal is to identify all enslaved and enslavers through primary sources, books, wills, church accounts, instead of living among hundreds of others in a row of sweltering plantation cabins as they were in the South, Long Island enslaved populations slept in eaves and attics in homes that are still standing. And don't think for one moment those white owners did not kill, torture, abuse, and even separate the families. Slavery in America is not only a Southern horror. My project findings became a domino effect on Long Island. Town after town on Long Island started to discover their own horrific history of black slavery. School districts on Long Island began to develop true, factual, black history curriculums. One example of something that's discussed in the curriculum how do you explain all men are created equal? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness could exist with the practice of slavery. Black history is both violent and graphic. We don't want to traumatize our students. We need a factual black history curriculum taught by qualified teachers. How will, I, how will the black student maneuver in society once they step out into the real world. We want to avoid for our black students going from school to pipeline prison. Look that up. America and Palm Beach, it's time to tell the truth and to teach the truth about black history, black facts, not history. Thank you, Cora Perry, Annie Ruth Nelson. Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening, Superintendent and Board Members. I am Annie Ruth Nelson, City of West Palm Beach, a graduate of Roosevelt High School and president of the African American Research Library and Cultural Center, known as ARLIC. I am here to thank you for your support of the budget approval for phase two library and museum and support of the total historic Roosevelt project. Throughout Florida, black high schools that were closed due to integration were renamed as community centers, elementary or junior high schools, museum or some type of resource facility. Those efforts diminished the void and despair and ignited hope in the residents and assisted in revitalizing the neighborhoods. The Roosevelt Project aims to do that through educational programming that is focused on the development of the full human, a library to empower and inspire people to love learning 
and support for academic studies and improvement of literacy. A museum which will showcase African American experiences with focus on Palm Beach County and a multi-purpose gymnasium for hosting a wide range of social and cultural events, including sports. Mrs. Ineri E. Hutnell have echoed our aim for this project over the years on TV and in the newspapers. And we are collaborating to advance our collective knowledge with local historians, arts and culture organizations to commemorate and preserve our history for research by students and scholars and to support educators teaching about African and African American history. We believe it is important for the next generation to know about all histories without being denied the full African American history as part of American history. The governor has said African American studies have no educational value and limits what can be taught about its history because it might make some white people feel bad. I quote, Last year, the Library Association reported 4,240 book titles were targeted for censorship in libraries and schools, end of quote. These kinds of threats to our democracy should be challenged because denying free speech is unconstitutional even when you disagree with facts and not fiction. <clears throat> we would also like to thank Joe Sanchez and David Dolan's department for support they're giving to the project to meet the needs and wants of the community whose wish is to have a black history museum reflected of Palm Beach County's history at Roosevelt where future generations can come to access information about their heritage with honor and pride. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Good evening, Superintendent Burke, Chair Brills, and to all the district school board representatives. My name is Cora Stustep Perry. I am the president of the Industrial Roosevelt High School National Alumni Association and Friends, and a 1965 graduate of Roosevelt. In 2022, for the first time, the following communities and community organizations came together to discuss and define what programs and services the community wants to have on the Roosevelt High School campus. There were 12 community organizations. They are the Industrial Roosevelt Alumni, the African American Research Library Museum of Cultural Center, ARLIC, Bridge Builders of the Palm Beaches, American Legion, West Palm Beach, Post 199, The Storm of 1928, Black Village Voices, Pleasant City, Coleman Park, Roosevelt Estate Neighborhood, Pinewood Parks Neighborhood, Westfield Neighborhood Association, and Men in New Development. These are just a summary of our collective decision to keep the name Roosevelt High School, to preserve the, preserve the furniture on Tamron, to have STEM and vocational programs, and preserve the gymnasium as a multipurpose center. The multipurpose center will create opportunities for social, community connections, and engagements. The center will provide the community with sufficient space for a wide variety of social activities and services to include sports, cultural events, performances, concerts, banquets, and much more. The center will be equipped with surround sound, processor, receiver, high quality screens, speakers, and multi-purpose cinema seats to accommodate a wide variety of events and activities. We recently had the opportunity to meet with Mr. Sanchez and the contractors and request we continue to have these meetings to share what the community has requested, which is most important. Promises were made, promises must be kept, and we continue to keep the faith that you will continue to preserve Roosevelt High School as promised. Thank you, have a blessed evening. Thank you. Ashley Labod and Curtis Sherrod. Ashley Labod. So earlier it was discussed about the teacher's salary and time and time again I come here and I tell you that you have plenty of departments that you could get rid of so that us teachers could make more. So 
I would look at that. As for the Jeff Bezos Academy, it blows my mind that time and time again, we are connecting with people that have no idea about education. He does not have any idea of education. There's no background for it, and it should not happen. I would ask that you guys get rid of that decision because for me, it's basically saying, oh, well, he has a lot of money and it's going into our pockets. <clears throat> he has a political agenda, he has access to elites, and the funding from the politicians. FAU apparently is now connected with him as well. That's where they want to put one of the campuses. It is a lottery, and the first priority is our homeless, which we had also talked about earlier today. Again, funding, I'm wondering where it's going. The Texas AG is now investigating nonprofits, charities, and NGOs that have to do with trafficking kids. We have 44 non-for-profits that we work for, and I would like to know, are any of them linked to that? Because if we go back, Royal Palm Beach High School had 15 students that were lured to Epstein's mansion, and that was District 6. Who, know, who knew about it that was on the board? Is this why members have been quitting their positions? I would also like to bring up, and that was November 5th from Palm Beach Post. I'd also like to bring up the data sharing agreement. Time and time again, we are sharing our students' data with third-party companies. I read one of the forms that you guys had, and it does say that it's not going to share, but it's not very clear, and the wording, of course, is done oh so slightly, so that parents may not know how to fill those out. So I would be very clear, and it should not be shared with third-party companies ever. As for the mom for the CPR, I was here when she spoke to you complaining about it, and I told her that you would follow her out and follow up. You did, now the teacher got an award. And when she brought up that everybody should have CPR certification and first aid, like my school does, um, our superintendent shook his head and was smiling about it. So there are people here watching all of you, and I will stand for these kids. It's my 12th year teaching in this district. I adore what I do, and I will stand up for the kids and the parents as long as I am teaching and probably beyond. Even if I won the lottery, I would come here and I would speak and I would still teach. So I expect you guys to step up because the dominoes are starting to fall and everybody is watching you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sherrod? Yes. My name is Curtis Sherrod. I'm a member of a coalition for black student achievement. I'm here to talk about black fact, not fiction. Okay, first I'd like to piggyback on the young lady who was up here talking about New York. New York is the largest city in the world precisely because it had the greatest number of slaves in the New World other than Charleston, South Carolina. All right? Hundreds of acres of Manhattan, as a matter of fact, were owned by Africans. Okay? That's why Wall Street has its name, because there was a wall between white America and black America. Central Park was a home to a black village of roughly 1,000, 2,000 people. Okay, all these things have disappeared from our history books and nobody really wants to talk about them. Okay, um, other than that, one more thing, I want to, before I get into my speech, what a little bit there is of it, is that um, the longest war in American history was not Afghanistan. It was fought right here in Florida from, eight, from 1686 when the Spanish governor of uh, St. Augustine commissioned an all-black regiment to 1852, the last of the so-called Seminole Wars. And as for the Seminole Wars, uh, there was a letter written to the Secretary of War, which is what they call it, what it was back then. They, don't call, they call it Secretary of Defense now. But uh, they call it Secretary of War at the time. It, it ended, have no doubt, this is a Negro, not an Indian war. Okay? So, again, the history of slavery here in, the, in, in Florida is some of the most horrific there is in, in, in history, period. Okay? It, uh, also, Florida led the nation in lynching per capita. All right? Now, I want to talk about evil triplets. I took an African-American history class to renew my certificate at IRCC in 2008. 
The final was to go through a series of books, most of whom are probably banned today, and create a PowerPoint uh, about those books. I chose to title three triplets. I subtitled Jim Crow, Apartheid, and Zionism. Zionism is not Judaism, okay? It is an ideology, all right, to which you can draw a straight line from Netanyahu today to Menachem Begin, who blew up the King David Hotel in 1948 and orchestrated what became known as the Nakba or catastrophe. And this, they don't want to forget the uh, Holocaust. The, the Palestinians don't want to f forget the, palace, the uh, catastrophe. Over six million Palestinians were forcibly removed from their land. Thank you, Adrian Smith. Hello again, Adrian Smith. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, this evening about uh, the preservation of sexual morality uh, in school environment and in the school campuses. Um, you just recently, I had expressed my opposition to your honoring. Uh, LGBTQAI History Month, uh, as if that that somehow equates to a group of people such as, for example, African American History Month, Latin American History Month. We are you're making declarations over the heads of these juveniles, these students, to honor, to honor. Immorality and sexual immorality is, is something that is extremely relevant and important to recognize for students for their future. And I have brought this subject up before. You're essentially putting a banner over a month of the school of the children stating honor, honor bisexuality, honor transvestites, honor homosexuality, honor... And we are not there to put up a banner over the students to honor sexual immorality. It has no place over the schools, okay? So there needs to be a distinction. I stated my opposition. There's a reason why it's not allowed to have the rainbow flag in the schools, okay? There's a defining principle that's involved with this. Now you're, you're honoring these, these entities, and I had said to you last year, why don't you give a month honoring students that would like to practice abstinence, that would like to preserve their virginity, but you ignore it. You ignore the church. What about devoting a month of, uh, of uh, honoring uh, perhaps uh, the Virgin Mary and uh, honoring uh, uh, abstinence, honoring... Uh, the preservation of morality, honoring the patriarch saints, but you won't do that. And I think that there's a, 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 a serious, significant problem, and I don't know why that people are not waking up to this, but it's damaging the future generations of children. You're taking children in a vulnerable age group, and you're a, a, a putting this uh, banner over them, this uh, recognizing these groups that are essentially there to that they are going to abstract, distract and cause these children to go a bad direction in their life. We don't invite the uh, adult club uh, 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 entertainment industry to the schools, do we? The, the topless bar uh, owners and everything to the school and, and honor them? Thank you. Board members, that's going to bring us to our discussion item. Mr. Ferguson. Thank you, Madam Chair. So just wanted to follow up on this DDEC um, presentation. So I had conversations with um, Mr. Oswald. He's doing a great job uh, leading the discussion with DDEC. And I spoke with Ms. Thaddeus as well. So when this initially was discussed um, with the DDEC several months ago, this concept of successful black males, it caused me to bristle even back then. Um, Ms. Thaddeus has already addressed this and said that they're, the DDEC is going to address this issue because I was offended by it because I felt that it was exclusionary, even though, as I understand what a successful black male is, that definitely would have been me. But obviously, I'm concerned about all black males 
Um, we hear persons come up here every month and kind of talk at us. Um, I don't necessarily know how many options they give us in terms of actionable items, but in any event, I did want to have a discussion with the board at large in terms of at the end of the day, it seems to me that whether it's the DDEC or the number of persons who have come to say, hey, we need to see blacks, black people in general, African Americans in general, people from, of the African diaspora in general, um, this is what I think is really being said. We have to do a better job of normalizing their expectation for success. And it, I do think that's a serious issue because even for me, when I was in school um, at Lincoln, when I was first tested for gifted in the first grade, I remember being around this little small circle, maybe with four of us at a table. And I remember, because we could actually look at each other's papers, I guess the circle of trust was, was large back then. But I remember purposefully changing some of my answers to the wrong, what I knew was the wrong answers, so that I didn't stick out too far from my, my colleagues. And I'm glad that I was still able to, um, I guess, meet the mark to be tested for gifted. And I wonder, in hindsight, how different my life would have been, because there definitely were two teachers that I had in, had the chance to be tutored under. One was Mr. Signer at um, Bear Lakes Middle, and one was Ms. Pelser at Military Trail Elementary. They both were amazing teachers, some of my better teachers. Mr. Preston was the best, rest in peace, but they were definitely my top. 10 for sure. And then when I was at Suncoast, I remember there was a large falling off of, of many of the black students in that sophomore to junior year when it really kind of got rigorous. And I actually pondered stepping, stepping back because I did kind of feel eh, somewhat ostracized from the standpoint that you're this pretty good athlete, fine on the football field, basketball track, but in terms of when we were actually in the school and the space and the classes, there were not many black males. And so I'm coming from this from the position that many of you just cannot speak to as a black male. Many of the people who speak here can't speak to this position as a black male. And I will tell you that sometimes it has, it was very isolating. And I guess I was one of the fortunate ones because I can see now in this ever advancing age, how some persons went left when they should have gone right or gone straight. And I see how they have fallen off. And I remember just life had it that we were there at that kind of penultimate moment when they went a different direction because they felt like they didn't have any support. And so I'm saying all that because looking at this report from the DDEC, frankly, a lot of these things actually are in place. I think this district does a better than average job in this regard, especially when you compare it to other neighboring school districts and just frankly across the country. But I'm asking for you all as our respective representatives in districts one through six to champion this cause from the standpoint of just having your presence in the space as far as that goes. So whether we're talking about um, the issue of the Holocaust, Chairman Brill is exceptional in that space, and I support that because I think there's a lot that we all can learn, irrespective of what our, our heritage is, from that, from that, at this point, shared experience. People who, were, people who were sought to be eradicated by a group of people, which, by the way, there are definitely some people here whose ancestors were Nazis, and I don't see us hesitating to, to speak to the nefarious um, results of that, of that just shameful, shameful regime that was in Germany in the 30s and 40s. Um, board member Whitfield, all of you are doing, but I'm just saying, I'm just gonna say those two not to belabor this point. She's an amazing advocate for homelessness um, as far as that goes. And I support both of those initiatives as well as others, whether we're talking about the, Latin, the Hispanic American experience here as well, I support all of those things. But I think that we all, to the extent that we can, should do a better job in our respective districts of trying to normalize the expectation for success. Um, and to that point, I think we should normalize it for all students, irrespective of whether we believe they're, quote, high academic achieving black male students. You never know when people are gonna come into their season. So even those students that are in the bottom 25th, I say let's take the, the, the raise the roof on the expectations for them. Uh, I think Chief of Schools, Ed Tierney has done a good job, and Chief Academic Officer, uh, Dr. Sheffield has, have done a great job as well in terms of saying, hey, look, let's start putting these children in advanced placement courses. Let's not just assume that they're regular students because a lot of times people will rise to the, the level that they believe that you expect them to reach at. And then what about that middle 50? Because we always are talking about the people on the high end and the low end, but what about that child, again, who hasn't quite found their, found their, their voice yet in terms of this is what I want to do. Or, you know, I really see the value of coming to school every day and being around these amazing students and teachers and things of that nature. What are we doing to support them, gird them, the scaffolding? I hear a lot of the academics use these type of words, scaffolding. Well, what about the scaffolding for all 
of black males. And so, um, like I said, I think it just needed to be, it needed to be addressed um, definitely by me as the one black male who's been on this board in the last 30 years and one of three uh, in the past, shoot, almost 60 years. Um, but I am asking you as my colleagues, I think you all have been excellent to work for and amazing to work with, not work for, work with, excuse me, definitely not working for you, uh, working with you. Uh, over these over these brief uh, 16 or 18 months, however long it's been, but I really do think there's there's a this is the time now for us to kind of get out into the community and esteem and affirm these children because generally speaking, you all know this to be a fact. The data points to it that we as black males as a populace tend to be the tail and not the head. Um, and if we could just empower these geniuses, because a lot of them actually are. I've represented many of them who've come to themselves in later years, and I just my heart aches for them because I feel like if they had had that same level of vigor and focus when they were in kindergarten through 12th grade, how much more successful would they have been in by association? How much better would Palm Beach County in the state of Florida and the U.S. of AB? So I can tell you from these different um, national conferences that I've, I've been to in this last six months, this is the conversation that's being had from Alaska all the way through here in Florida. So again, I'm just asking you as board members, we don't have the go through the show of, of hands and things of that nature, but I'm asking you as a human being to, to come out and esteem and affirm black males in your, in your respective districts by going to the different events that they're at, um, engaging with the principals. And this is a conversation we'll have for another day. I've learned from one of my other board members that's not an agenda item, so I'm not gonna go down that rabbit hole right now, but there definitely needs to be some, in my opinion, and I'm saying it now, there should be a substantial turnover in terms of some of my leaders because I don't believe that they truly believe that a lot of our children, not just the black males, in many other demographics, that they don't see the potential for success in them, that they're just a body that is needed to help support their individual careers. And I think that this is a career service. If you don't have an absolute heart for service, this is the wrong profession for you. I'm just saying that. I know Mr. Kubrick's like, what are you doing right now? But I'm doing it. It's time to, it's time to, it's time to be real about this thing. Uh, life is short. We cannot afford to have a bad year as a school district. We cannot afford to have a bad year as a school. These students definitely cannot afford to have a bad year because what is not said in my experience, respectfully to the educators, you experts that you are, is what happens on the back end once these children graduate. Are they really ready to excel and succeed? Because I've seen countless number of district um, product who are not ready. They have zero to low interpersonal skills. They're terrible with money. Their literacy skills are, frankly, not where they need to be to be in the spaces that I move in. And many of you know what my profession is. So my expectation as an employer is that we do a better job of empowering these children, normalizing their uh, aspiration for success, if you will, and, and make sure that they don't feel alone. Like, oh, wow, what am I doing up here? They should have an expectation, because I can assure you that I have that expectation. Um, thankfully to my parents and teachers and other people. And some, it's just an inherent thing that I think we all have, but we have to adduce, bring that out of all of our children. But the topic for discussion today is the black male, because as I said, historically, if you look at the data, we're the tail. And frankly, we need to be, we need to be much further along than that. So again, I'm gonna step down off my soapbox now, um, but this is something that in District 7, I can assure you, you will start seeing some objective um, objective gains that are uncontrovertible, un that can't be debated. And I'm hoping that in these next two to four to six to 10 years that across this county, that we do what we've done in many other areas, which is to be a leader. We've already influenced Palm, I'm sorry, Broward and many other counties in terms of the metal detectors and things of that nature. Um, we talk about equity, and I think you all remember that I kind of took exception to that equity statement way back when, because I'm done with the words. It's time to be about the business of empowering these students. They're the future generation. So if we're just taking photos, and I'm not saying that we are, but if we were comfortable with just taking photos and talking about, oh, how bad the black males are doing, or whoever, the black males, the Hispanic females, Hispanic males, white males, white students, whatever the case may be, our children with special needs, we ain't getting it. And I said it that way because that's actually how I like to talk. It makes me feel good to say that. But you know what I'm saying. We ain't getting it. And so it's time for us to get it. And so I hope that you all, and I feel confident and I feel pretty secure that all of you feel the same way. 
but as long as we have life, and particularly as long as we're in these positions, I would ask that we make a more concerted effort to help that group, my group, the black male group, the people who feel comfortable saying just what I said, we ain't getting it. I mean, I could say it the right way, or at least what they told us in school was the right way, but that's a whole other language too. But you all are smart and subject matter educators, so you know where I'm going with that. Um, but let's get it, and let's be about the business. It's, best, it's good business for this county for us to do this, and it's long since overdue um, as far as that goes. But again, this is my request, and I'm hoping that you all will come along with me in, in this effort to make this truly the best county uh, in this state and this country. So thank you all for allow indulging me tonight. Thank you, Mrs. Whitfield. Thank you so much, and thank you, Mr. Ferguson, for bringing this up. Um, I think, um, you know, I feel very confident, as you do, that this board is unified in making sure that every child has the ability and expectation that we want them to be um, successful and that we believe in them. Um, but I, I do thank the um, District Diversity and Equity Committee for putting together these recommendations because I think, um, just as you brought this up and brought this to our attention, is that we should always be talking about this and that we should be, even though we are unified, I think the community needs to hear it from us frequently, that we believe in every one of our children's ability to succeed. And one of the things that they put on their list that I that I really love is to um, put a priority on creating environments that develop and enhance the sense of belonging and connectedness, something that Mr. Oswald works on every day. Many of our staff members work on every day. Um, but that's something we can always remind the community that we believe in as a board and as a community and that we're going to continue to work towards it. So thank you for bringing it back up. Thank you. And I'm just going to chime in and just um, tell Mr. Ferguson that not only do I agree, but I also want to point out that we've historically had an over-identification of black males in our ESC programs. And we need to make sure that we have, and this is one of the things that drove me to fight for inclusion in our district and high expectations for our students with disabilities and putting them in the regular classroom. We don't want those students to suffer a double whammy because we know that many times, for example, with autism, that there's a gift, they have strengths, and we need to make sure that they achieve. So I would take it one step further and make sure that, our, that we address that with our students with special needs you know, as well, and, and keep an eye also on the over-identification. So thank you. So board members, um, I'd like to take a motion to adjourn. Motion by, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see that you pushed that. Mrs. Andrews. And I want to thank Mr. Ferguson for bringing it up. It's really important, especially for our black males, but for all of our children. And I think it starts in the classroom with our teachers. We heard someone talking about counselors today. It starts within the school center, and it starts at home with the parents. And we're just an extension of all of that and making it happen. And I think we have to continue to have these conversations about what we see that's happening within our communities, within our schools, and with our children. It's obvious that there's a lot of work that needs to be done, and I do appreciate the district in stepping forth to do a lot of the things that need to be done. But I can say this board has been very, very active in making sure that we put programs in place. Mr. Tierney, I just walked the schools with you uh, a few years ago when we actually looked at all of the children, especially our black boys, and how we could get them in those advanced placement courses, those high-level courses. And we sat down with the principals and the counselors and the leaders in all of those schools, especially in my district, and I felt really good about that. And we've seen a lot of good results. But we also have to have the parents help us, too, and be out in the communities where the schools are and listen. It takes great leaders uh, and the principals as well as teachers uh, working with our students, and there's a lot of work to be done all over the country when we talk about our black males, our ESC students, those children of color that who have been left behind for so long, but for any child that's being left behind. When we look at our, our country right now, unemployment, uh, the high cost of living, people are suffering, and children are suffering through mental health. So there's so many things that we've got to keep up with, but I think as board members, we have to speak out when we see it's not right. Uh, let our superintendent, as well as the board, know that it's our priority to take care of all of our children. And we know we've seen what's happened to the black males over the years all over the country. And we have to put and implement programs that's going to take them to the next level to catch them up. 
but a lot of our children are suffering all over since the pandemic, before the pandemic, and more so since the pandemic. So there's so much work to be done, but I do have confidence in everybody that's sitting on this board. We're fighting for all of the children. And thank you, Mr. Oswald and the team, Ms. Sheffield, Dr. Uh, 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 the doctors out there, or Dr. Sheffield and our superintendent. I think you get it, <laughs> and you know what we have to do. And we are going to keep our focus on the prize, and it's always about our children. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Vice Chair McQuinn. Obviously, I totally agree with um, Board Member Ferguson. As one of the older white females, I've been obviously looking for years. I've had the privilege of most of my education as a teacher and assistant principal and principal of working with our Riviera Beach students and knowing my heart, I, I, you know, I go to the churches to try to reach out to in, all of our, my black students, but I know that at Suncoast, it was a lot of stress for our black males to feel that they weren't set apart. They didn't want to look smart very often, and we did lose them. I would want to know, and this would be through the superintendent, I read some of the recommendations while still trying to pay attention to the meeting. And one is that we bring forward whatever the, um, the race of the teacher is, but look at those teachers who are having success with our black males. Starting with kindergarten, let's find those teachers who are having success and bring them to talk to our principals who then can implement that within their schools. I think that's a very doable thing. At a minimum, we could implement like now. And so we have to start with some very specific, yes, we will do this, that are very concrete things. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ferguson. One last thing, Madam Chair, and thank you again. Um, this is directed to the superintendent. Um, Mr. Cooper, by way of the superintendent, I think we really should look at, be more intentional, Mr. Superintendent, about hiring more black males as teachers, especially in schools that have high numbers of black males, because the influence that a positive black male figure can have on a young black male, respectfully, Ms. Madam Chair, that's a one-of-one -one thing. A black female teacher can't quite do it. A white male or female teacher can't quite do it. A Latino male or female teacher can't do it. They just can't. Um, and if you know the dynamics of many of these communities in regard to um, the lack of black male influence on these children, again, uh, from terms of business, of, from the business perspective of educating a student, I think that's something that we really, really, really have to um, take a hard look at. So in that regard, Mr. Kubrick, I'm really just trying to make the way for some additional black male teachers. So those lukewarm teachers, speaking for myself, go ahead and step aside because there really are some, some persons who, are, who have the heart for education, who may come from an unconventional uh, pathway in terms of not being an education major and things of that nature, that if we would just open the door to them, we have a lot of gain. So Mr. Superintendent, I think you're doing a great job. And this is just my request as a child of the school district who happens to be sitting on this board right now. Let's get more black males in schools where they can be a great influence to our, our black male students. Thank you. Thank you. So now I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, second by Ms. Ayala. Any discussion? All in favor? All opposed? Mo motion carries unanimously. Drive safely. Thank you.